What's the best EV crossover or electric mid-size SUV? We have a set of vehicles in this comparison review and we will show you which one is the most suitable for you and which competitor is the best in the individual aspects. Upcoming, the Tesla Model Y, the VW ID4, the Hyundai Ioniq 5, the Audi Q4 e-tron, the Ford Mustang Mach-E, the Škoda Enyaq and the BMW iX3. Let's go with the first one. Today it's time for an extensive Autobahn test of the Tesla Model Y. How good is it on the German motorway? How does it rate against the Tesla Model 3? How does it rate against the competitors like the VW ID4 GTX? We'll all find out here in Autogefühl with Thomas. Let's go! In the front, the typical sleek Tesla design. Everything set on wind efficiency. And yes, they are indeed very efficient overall. That leads to a high range. Soon more to that. With 4,75 or 187 inches, the Tesla Model Y is a little bit longer, wider, and of course higher than the Model 3. And main change is that the Tesla Model 3 is mainly based on a steel chassis. This one here, like the S and the X, based on an aluminum chassis, an all new one. And also for the other rear and front parts, they use this so-called Giga casting. So that means less parts overall for the chassis. That makes the riding better as for the chassis rigidity. So definitely stiffer body. And we'll see how that one plays out in the driving part very soon. This will be very interesting. 19 or 20 inch wheels for the long range model, which we have here today. All wheel drive, one electric motor in the front, one in the rear. Performance model will also get 21 inch wheels. These here are the 20 inch wheels. However, if you want the best comfort, stick with the smallest wheels available. Black door handles and also black frames around. This has been a change also for the Model Y now, if you could get it before. Now the first time we can also get ones in Germany. These here are the Shanghai built models so far. And of course, when the Gigafactory close to Berlin is finished, then this will also be built in Germany. This will also be very exciting. We'll keep you updated with that. In the rear, definitely a small Tesla Model X, definitely. But I think the shapes then work definitely better. So it looks a little bit more elegant than the more bulky X in the rear here. As for the acceleration figures, here for the long range model, all wheel drive, five seconds to one kilometers an hour or 4.8 seconds to 60 miles an hour. And for the performance model, it's 3.7 seconds to one kilometers an hour or 3.5 seconds to 60 miles an hour. However, this one here, I can tell you from the driving part, is already really, really quick. And what's the top speed? Yeah, we did find out today in the driving part. <laughs> Look out forward to that. Turning indicators, by the way, in the front, they are very visible. In the rear, they are smaller, however, not as small as with the Model 3. So this is definitely an improvement. With the Model 3, we often saw horrible panel gaps, the famous German Spaltmaße. But here, look at that, here in that Model Y, Shanghai build, that all looks really good and sophisticated. So nothing to complain here at all. This one also here with a very smooth transition. So this is not topsy-turvy and here, once again, very well aligned. And what else is important? HEPA filter is included, heat pump is included, 14 speakers for that sound system also included. It makes it so easy to configure such a Model Y. It's not the cheapest one from the entry price, but then again, the price also doesn't go up. And so it, they make it really easy for the customer to pick a vehicle then. Just pick the color, interior, the color, and that's basically it. Oh, and if you get a towing hook, 1.6 tons or 3,500 pounds of towing capacity. 77 kilowatt hours for that battery here, checked it in the papers. And here is a charging port, 270 kilowatt max at the Tesla supercharger. As a car key you get these key cards, but you can also order a real key for from the shop. I would recommend you to do that, otherwise use your smartphone. Then door handles fold like this and yeah, not, they're not the most practical, but they are also integrated and feel actually quite, quite good. So then door closing sound, not most sophisticated, but actually quite good for a frameless door vehicle. So it's okay. And what's really interesting is this here in the front is, you can see it right there, 
dual insulation glass. Inside of the door, soft touch here, then we have this matte wood insert and so many of you guys said yes there's also the white interior available which then has this bright insert and I would just like to see the white interior with the bright wood and yeah so many people wished for that. Maybe Elon listen to our community here. Then inside microfiber here as well, soft touch here too. This is then the emergency handle, the manual one. Otherwise you open the door right here then from the inside. And once again, black or white interior, all the red, all animal free, way to go Tesla. So no animal cruelty for this model when you buy it. Really awesome job to make it standard and the only option. Steering wheel, also everything simplistic. Left side for volume, right side you press it for the voice control, for example. And of course, everything else in that screen. Seating position is not uncomfortable. However, the seats themselves, mm, they could be a little wider and longer, especially for taller people. So not really that suitable if you're just a little bit taller. So they could work on that. But the base ergonomics are actually quite okay. And headroom here, one minute is six, six, one minute is six or six foot one. It's actually way more than enough because they just have this fixed panoramic roof. What I really like about this interior is that it's so simplistic and that really calms you down. On the other hand, either instruments or head-up display would be cool. So otherwise you just see the speed here in the upper left corner and it's okay. You do get along. However, it would still be good. Yes. Yeah. So you <laughs> wouldn't have the seatbelt on. Bing, bing, bing. It would be better to have either digital instruments or a head-up display as an option. So come on, Elon. Other than that, here two inductive charging pads for your phones and also with a nice microfiber cover. And a lot of space here in the middle console right there. Cup holes, they are not adaptive though. And here also underneath a lot of space. So that's really good. So you feel as it would be quite spacious. And once again, the build quality here, meanwhile, soft touch here in the front, the great matte wood here. Build quality has been so topped up if you compare it to earlier Tesla models. So the interior build quality is meanwhile definitely premium. And definitely a lot to discover in that screen here. First of all, as for the energy consumption, that is very interesting. So this is more here with some, you know, city rural traffic driving slowly, not much on the motorway. And if motorway a little bit slower, then we like 13 kilowatt hours on 100 kilometers. So that's some 22 kilowatt hours on 100 miles. I just changed that in the display. Wow, that's amazing. And that would rather mean some like 600 kilometers or 350 miles of range. However, if you include more autobahn and so on, it rather goes down towards 400 kilometers and 250 miles. Soon you'll also see, you know, in our driving part, a graph where we have more autobahn share. So that really depends on how and where you drive. This car is capable of great efficiency. But at some point, of course, when it goes speedy on the motorway, it is reduced. Then temperature control is down here. Um, and, you know, you can slide it like this. And of course, with the voice control, set temperature to 20 degrees. Like this, or I'm cold. Then it also increases. So you have some different possibilities still. You know, I'm a fan of manual climate dials. So, but this is again about this whole reduction of everything. The camera is really cool. I just still can't get over it why it has a different different light temperature here for the side cams. You know, um, I really don't get that. You know, do you? Then here in display, you can set different modes. For example, also a screen clean mode, and you can you know wipe it everything with a microfiber towel without you know. Oh, hold to exit yes. Exit in three, two, one. Let's go back to the screen. <laughs> um, display mode, by the way, also has a night mode like this. So uh, this is quite fancy because when you see later on in the driving part, it depends on the time when it's switching and it switched right after our driving part. This was very interesting. So before it was kind of like too bright. So good to have also this night mode. It switches again automatically, but maybe a little bit earlier would be cool. So here, of course, and more with the um, you know daytime driving mode. So many things to discover right there. What's always important that usually I have the acceleration set to chill because it's just more chilly and right and the standard acceleration is really fast. You will see that very soon. Oh yeah, and then, you know, with the steering wheel and mirror control, yeah, that to do it here and then over the steering wheel, not the most practical thing. And of course, also with the glove box, you know, 
why just you know you don't have like a normal glove box control that would be definitely cooler rear bench first of all soft touch here at the rear of the doors that's great also microfiber inserts so this is really premium quality here for the interior then it's not the longest vehicle but definitely enough legroom here and there's no middle tunnel whatsoever so really using this ev platform headroom also enough left because you have this panoramic roof that looks really cool but yeah it does get hot in hot days but overall comfortable seating position here for the rear as for adjusting the rear part here you see you can put like this more upright but then you can also put a little bit more backwards so that's actually possible to have a more like you know you know, leaning back position here in the middle part you can also easily sit as a tall adult to USB-C charger and yeah hardly ever we see that it's so well executed that there's no middle tunnel whatsoever really using this EV platform here in the middle part you can also fold out some cup holders they are also adaptive actually and actually a very wide middle console here so it's kind of relaxing and also for the rear passengers and also in this model right there panel gaps very well aligned on the interior and here for example for these hangers click click nice clicking sound soft dampened so indeed more and more premium interior details today it's time to measure the trunk with my new dual ruler here so centimeters on one side inch on the other side and also in the black style now because yeah gmail offers it now tesla offers it on the display apple also offers a dark mode so yeah for maybe better contrast so here the length is one meters and ten or 43 inches that's very good then here in the width let's see so the width right here is 95 centimeters or yeah we can very well switch it around then <laughs> or 37 inches also well usable and the overall height right there because there's no cover anyway this then here at 28 inches or here 70 centimeters and you can very well fold the seats from here already so it's a very good function here electric control that's the way that's the way <laughs> hashtag movie quote or series quote then there we go yeah it's almost at this two meters mark so one meters 90 here to my driving position or 76 inches so very well usable and there's hardly any you know big difference to the tesla model x for example here big space underneath you can put also your cabin trolley in there and also have it here like you know standing upright so this is very very convincing what we see here you can see the hatch opens really really wide with one meters 86 or six foot one. i can stand underneath it and if i want to secure it in a position that it doesn't hit the roof of my basement garage same as we know from other vehicles you just press and hold the closing button for example you put it manual in this position and then press and hold and then it will next time just go up to this position so that's definitely also a good thing to have however it does not have this sensor like the model x has then child safety test was a little bit weird that direction but it did work and then let's listen to the closing sound when it really closes Yeah, it's a little bit loud, you know, but this one was actually quite good. But, you know, sometimes I had it was like, you know, like really like slamming it through. This time was better. I'm not sure why it's like sometimes differently. Let's try it again. Maybe it was just like a one time thing. You know, this one was quite okay. Not very sophisticated, but still quite okay. Well, of course, there is a trunk and a quite spacious one. And you can, for example, store additional charging cables in here. Welcome to Thomas's driving lounge today, electric autobahn <laughs> driving lounge. And let's first start with the fuel economy, well, the energy economy, of course, for the EVs. So my long-term average now is like some 18, 19 kilowatt hours on one kilometer, so something like 29, 30 kilowatt hours on 100 miles. Short term, a little bit better. You see here when I also have some topography changes in the city and so on, and more city driving. So that means actually, when you have a lot of autobahn, a lot of motorway share, like 100 kilometers an hour, 120 kilometers an hour, 60, 70 miles and so on, you more get to this 400 kilometers of range or 250 miles of range. When you have more city traffic share and more using these advantages of the EVs, topography changes, stop and go and so on, and really go like a super efficient run, 
500 kilometers or 300 miles of range. That's possible theoretically, but when you more drive it like a German, rather not. Then <laughs> it's more like 400 kilometers or 250 miles. And what do I mean by that? It's to follow right now. So let's check this out, the acceleration. And well, this display is quite bright. I mean, it looks brighter than it actually is. So let's, let me tune it down. So on camera, it looks even brighter than it actually is here now. I'm in the standard driving mode and I'm starting here from 30 kilometers an hour, long range all-wheel drive model. There's nothing coming, so empty at motorway. This is what you deserve, guys. Let's go. kilometers an hour, 125 miles an hour, and I mean, this is go going even faster here. You see here, let's see if we can get it to top speed. And that should be now. Oh, 219 kilometers an hour, it says now. That's the top speed, and wow. I mean, lane change here, kind of stable, but then again, when we have these waves, it shakes up a little bit. Steering is really sporty, so I have to be very precise and subtle with the steering wheel. Of course, suspension is not set on a node where you have like super sporty control over the car. It shakes up notably, notably again when you are in these waves. Noise insulation wise, as for the wind noises, that was actually quite good. And by the way here, I did not use the brakes at all. That was just recuperation. So you see here, very strong recuperation from the vehicle and also, you know, look at that. <laughs> that totally exceeds the figures. <laughs> look at that, look at that. So it, really, it exceeds the figures here from recuperation and it also exceeds the figures as for acceleration for the consumption and negative consumption basically. Wow. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. So that happens on a test here with Thomas and other Gefühl. Here in the tunnel, you can see, yeah, no ambient lighting at all whatsoever. A uh, little bit at the feet, or you know, but you can't ha can hardly see that. And the display is here really tuned down, but still it's a little bit bright. And yeah, even, you know, especially on that camera, you can see um, it's actually a little bit too bright maybe at that stage. There is this auto mode, but I have set the display all, all, brightness already to 0%. Um, yeah, and even in the auto mode, it decides to go, go for this one. Very interesting. So. As for noise and so on, I really have to say, once again, they worked on the noise insulation of the vehicles in general, and the Tesla Model Y is so far the best Tesla, I really have to say, in so many respects. And here, one kilometers an hour, 60 miles an hour, typical motorway speed. It's very silent as for the noise from wind and tire roll and so on. When does it get loud? When you're driving over some bumps. So anything that comes from the suspension. So when you're going in potholes, like bam, you, you feel it and you hear it. 20 inch wheels here. I do recommend to go with the 19 inch wheels here with this model and also not to go for the performance model. You've seen the performance here. It's a great performance when you take just around five seconds for this acceleration, even a little bit less in the, in the miles per hour, 60 miles per hour figure. That's more than enough, you know, and here, the car is really sporty, again, precise steering wheel. Wow, great acceleration out of the corner from the two electric motors, front and the rear. The car is so much fun, you know? So here, lane change. Wow, it feels like a go-kart, although it's an SUV. The only thing, you know, really high speed, then, you know, didn't feel that safe, actually, because it was shaking up too much, but we can't expect it from the vehicle. It's not meant to do that, and it also, it's not the task, you know, so this car does not have to be stable at 200 kilometers an hour or 125 miles an hour. No one will ever drive that except me in Germany. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so 99% of the customers will not use that. And yeah, I mean, I'm not sure how long is it even still allowed in Germany, for example, you know. Still, we do these tests here to really be able to compare the vehicles, how they perform at, you know, certain limits and certain things and wow this car has really given me a lot of driving fun this I really love about it it's very cool and when you now compare the competitors 
like the VW ID4 GTX or the Škoda Enyaq ADX or the Audi Q4 e-tron in the all-wheel drive trim, for example, the Ford Mustang GT, yeah, Ford Mustang E GT. So um, they're all a lot of fun because you have the instant torque and this one here is not less fun whatsoever. Really good, as I said, great handling also then from the acceleration. The only thing is really the suspension. So if you have the 19 inch wheels, it's maybe a little bit better because you have a little bit more dampening from the tire, but always when you're going over some, you know, some lines on the road, you know, some potholes and so on, you hear it like boom, and you also feel it. The suspension, how it reacts to, you know, uneven roads, that's not good at all. So this is kind of, I mean, so many things about this vehicle were really good. Big problem, definitely, no instruments, no head-up display. You can get along with this and the speed here, but it's not ideal, it's not, it's not good, you know. Head-up display or instruments, at least one of this is definitely missing. That's the one thing. And the other thing is definitely the suspension. This is where this still separates itself from the German competitors. The infotainment system with Tesla is way better. The suspension is way worse than with the Germans. One more acceleration, guys. Let's go. Woo! <laughs> that gives you the kick. That was from 80 kilometers an hour, and now we see, wow, that goes really in here. 180 kilometers an hour is still reasonably silent here as for the wind noise. So again, as for this respect, really nicely done. and. It still handles now quite well, this high-speed corner. So it also handles so much better than all the other Teslas. So this new aluminum chassis and with a Giga case casting, um, where you have like less pieces from the whole chassis, especially on how the front and the rear parts are being attached and so on. This has a big effect, so way less flexing you feel, especially if you compare it to the Model 3. The Tesla Model 3 feels you know, like it is flexing all over the place from, from the chassis the whole time. And this one here definitely feels more elaborated. I just wish they would have done more to the suspension. I mean, we've seen it with Tesla over the years that they keep improving and improving and improving. So this kind of gives me hope that they also do something about the suspension. Maybe even off an air suspension here, like they do for the X and the S here in the Model Y, or some adaptive dampers or something. Um, I don't know, that would be something. So, like the VW ID4 GTX, which is one of the main competitors, definitely offers adaptive suspension. The Ionic 5, by the way, does not offer adaptive suspension. So, this is something you know more towards the Volkswagen group, where the Enyaq and also the Q4 e tron do offer this adaptive suspension. Um, yeah, the Kia EV6 has also more sophisticated suspension. I talked to the suspension manager recently from Kia and they did something, you know, like they changed a lot in compared to the, to the Ionic 5. I will tell more about that when we drive the Kia EV6, definitely. This will be very interesting. But here, definitely, once again, driving wise reveals the suspension is the weakness of this vehicle. And as long as the road is even and good, that's fine, but you know, a lot of you guys are from countries or from certain regions, and even you know, when your country is kind of rich, there are always somewhere bad roads you can, can complain about, you know. So um, this is something, um, yeah, they can definitely um, improve even more, but still, however, a lot of fun in the driving, and it becomes even more apparent, you know, when, you know, when, when I took over this vehicle, I drove there in a Mercedes GLE in the in the AMG. Yes, it's a segment higher, definitely, but it has an AMG tuned suspension and 22 inch wheels. So the air suspension there was tuned like super stiff. And I switched to this one and thought like, what is this kind of suspension? You know, like more like, whoa. So and this kind of re revealed all the, the difference, you know. Um, yeah, so I mean, it, it's very interesting that like, we can really find out more about that, but everything else, you know, like steering performance, which you can also still set, you know, if you want a little bit more feedback here, or if you want it a little bit um, softer and so on, you can adjust that. 
acceleration wise once again really cool oh the display is again so <laughs> so so uh, bright at least in the camera again it appears brighter on camera because you know the, the iris is adjusting to that yeah and fun wise and like yeah how slalom wise it behaves this is so much better than the model 3 once again you know when i'm doing slalom in the model 3 it's fun it kind of feels go kart alike but it feels like plastic go kart alike you know like flexing go kart this one here feels like aluminum go kart where you do the slalom do you know do your thing and it does not flex and that's really cool and this one here does not look like a performance vehicle from the outside at all it doesn't have an amg badge doesn't have an m badge doesn't have an audi rs badge still when someone is behind you here and you like this like you're gone you had like a motorcycle you know <laughs> and everyone's like what was that what the hell like is this kind of like super sports car or what is it no it's a tesla model y yeah that's definitely a fun thing by the way about this harsh acceleration when i'm here alone now and i know like okay now the acceleration is coming i have steam in my own hand i'm used to these speeds i've driven so many different racetracks and so on and g-forces and i you know did i talk about that i rather grew up riding motorcycles i drove motocross before i had a driver's license actually so when you're used to these g-forces it's okay but when you're a passenger and also you're not used to these g-forces driving alongside here in the electric vehicles can be quite harsh on your bodies you know and i feel when i'm being shuttled in electric vehicles i often tell the driver like oh can you drive a little bit slower or may i accelerate less harsh and be gentle with the throttle when recuperation is happening because so many times it happened that as a passenger i got sick being driven in electric vehicles and that's the thing also that because the shuttle drivers need to get used to it has a lot to do definitely with the instant torque so you when you're driving people when you have you know a car full of people and definitely when you're driving like you're the driver and you know driving to the uh, to the club and in the evening or something and you don't want people to puke all, all over your vehicle be gentle with the throttle in both ways especially because this one here has one pedal driving feeling if you set it in that way you can set you can adjust the recuperation but usually i leave it on a harsh recuperation because positive thing safety thing here now oh reduce the speed lift your foot of the throttle reducing the speed and even in an emergency situation where you change to the brake pedal in this split of a second you already reduced a lot of your speed that's definitely very good so definitely in favor of the one pedal driving feeling of harsh recuperation in general however just when you can also control it when you're driving with people in the car um and that means when you want to reduce your speed with the with that one throttle pedal be gentle L you know slowly lift it that the, your passengers are not going like <laughs> all the time and then like you know so that's that's really something um you you need to watch out so very important thing here with electric vehicles um oh yeah two strong in front of us that's the old world <laughs> um yeah whoa that two stroke almost went over the bars because it almost hit the pavement like yeah that would have been a very ugly dash cam uh, recording here whoa 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 yeah and uh, that's isn't that something you know that that scooter here turns the throttle two stroke all the fumes come outside you're an electric vehicle and in this moment you kind of think like yeah probably i'm doing the right thing yeah again no it's just the locally reduced emissions the energy has to come from somewhere but i think the most important aspect is the potential of the electric vehicles co2 wise they're already more sustainable than combustion engines that's meanwhile clear with all the different studies that have been done mm. Of course it also then depends on the use case what is you know, the most you know the most useful car for your use case but then of course you have you know less with the oil but more than like with lithium and other mineral mining and so on this huge problem definitely but there's a potential for batteries to become more sustainable and then 
the cars are even more sustainable. So I think the potential of electric vehicles, that's what it's all about, definitely. Not what it's like currently, you know. Now in the tunnel, yeah, definitely missing some ambient lighting here. So the thing is, they have improved the build quality so much. If you compare it to the earlier Teslas, that's great. But there are still features missing where you say like, this is a premium car, period. Like the suspension, like ambient lighting, like an instrument or, or head-up display and so on. Uh, like when the hatch is closing and it's going like BAM, you know, so I want to be closing softly, for example, oh, the old S-Class in front of us here, I'm not sure if you've seen it. So there are still things missing where it's like when I pay like 60k euros in, in Germany for this vehicle, I want some features to be more premium, you know, still. It's a car that is a lot of fun. Now driving up out of Fruits Peak, wow, Ooh, the acceleration up the hill, this is amazing. Now, yeah, now I'm using a little bit of the brake. Wow, this is impressive. This is really, it's, it's not the performance version, it's not a sporty vehicle overall, but low center of gravity due to the battery pack. Great acceleration, feels so balanced here. The road is, oh, this is amazing. I mean, usually with this kind of driving fun, this kind of precision on the road, this kind of sporty handling we have with Sometimes like, you know, like a, like a Porsche 911 GT3 or something like with super highly tuned sports cars and you can have it here in a, let's say, normal electric vehicle, which isn't even one of the biggest and most expensive ones. It's not cheap at all. Talked about that uh, just, but it's amazing how much driving fun it gives you. And once again, chassis wise, no doubt, this is the best Tesla so far. And I think not only chassis-wise, also in so many other respects. And if the German build Model Y will be even better than the Shanghai build Model Y, which is this one here, then maybe I have to think about buying Tesla stocks again. But you know, when I feel suspension, I feel like, ah, but I don't buy Tesla stocks. And then when I feel like, you know, how well the car is handling here, also have in corner and how it's getting out of there and also how efficient it is and so on. Then I think, yeah, maybe it is a good idea if I said Tesla stocks again. Um, yeah, that's the thing. So you, you, you feel that I'm, I'm really enthusiastic about this vehicle. And there are things where I really have to say, no way, you know, like this is, here the road is like, do you hear that? The road is so bad here. And then you feel, especially from the rear X, like, and now to the potholes. And this is like really like, whoa, 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 whoa. And with like the VW ID4 GTX with the DCC adaptive dampers, which are an option, of course, this would be, for example, way better. And even better than, you know, when you have like, a, you know, some of the German premium vehicles. So that's, this is no doubt a difference. But other than that here, for example, easing the car around, good rear view camera, back again, some wheel spin. Yeah. This is great. I mean, still having so much fun and I talked all the way through this review and sometimes I just do more, you know, like a little bit more editing or something because there's not more to say to a vehicle, but here with this one, with the Model Y, there's so much to say about this vehicle and that's also cool, of course. It is still polarizing in a way and there are things that are so great and things that are not that great, definitely, but that all, you know, that's definitely making a vehicle interesting and to me also the thing is that I always have that with Teslas, you know, when, when I have it for a first day, some things that are bugging you say like, nah, you know, nah, maybe I wouldn't buy a Tesla. But then, you know, the longer you drive it, it's, like, ah, it's so easy to put an address in, even if you don't use voice input or, oh, cool, the supercharging um, network is still the best or like, oh, that was really efficient. Like, what is this energy consumption? Really so little energy being wasted and so on? And then you see the progress of like, oh, it's even more silent than one year ago when I drove it and so on. Then it kind of makes you, wait a minute, maybe I should buy a Tesla, you know? This is a very interesting thing, you know, because with, you know, the majority of the other vehicles, like especially when I drive like a German premium car, um, I say like, oh yeah, this is a very cool car. I can really imagine like, having that one you know when i drove the bmw z4 the first time and you're like this is so much fun i have to get this vehicle you know so 
something like this, you know. But the Tesla is really like this, um, more like you, the longer you use it, the more you see the advantages and then also um, rather become a fan, you know, like this buying for the why, not for the what, and swipe away some of the disadvantages that still have. And I can just stress again, I mean, we have gray roads here today and hardly any traffic. I pick this time of the day in the evening to have good light, soft light and also empty roads. And this is the most fun I ever had in a Tesla by far. And it's not the lowest Tesla. It's not the most powerful Tesla. Once again, it's the best Tesla out there there is at this moment. The VW ID4, Volkswagen's most important electric vehicle, mid-size EV SUV, now available as the GTX, supposed to build a bridge from the sporty GTI world to the sporty EV world with all-wheel drive called GTX. Here today on Auto Gefühl. I'm Thomas and of course I want to find out how sporty is it really and how capable is it also comparing it to the recent platform siblings, the Audi Q4 e-tron and also the Skoda Enyaq. They share the very same platform. Another competitor would be the Ford Mustang Mach-E, of course also the Tesla Model Y. So fierce competitors here for the VW ID4 and as the GTX version it has a sporty appearance. Here in the lower area a new black mesh grille so that looks quite fancy, overall definitely sport look and that's why I also picked the red today again for that bridge between GTI and the electric GTX. Light signature here, the strip goes all the way to the main headlamps, beautifully done and the matrix LED are included here in the GTX model. 4 meters 58 or 180 inches is the length here of the ID4 and the GTX here, this version, all-wheel drive model, starts with 20-inch wheels. Optional, these 21-inch wheels, the biggest one available. GTX batching right there. And special thing, whereas you would more have crossover cladding in the lower area, this one is here in the sporty version painted. So on the one hand, all-wheel drive and, you know, off-roadish X naming. On the other hand, sportier look. Does it work together? Well, I mean... Just look at it, I think it works well. However, you still have this kind of van style atmosphere, short hood there, but that also makes this electric platform so good on the inside, not too long, but a lot of space on the inside. Then interesting, the main electric motor is the rear one. That's the bigger one, has more horsepower output, and is mostly rear-wheel driven, it's a rear-wheel driven platform. And on acceleration peaks, also the front, Motor then, the additional one here, is being used. But as soon as you stop accelerating, it's once again mainly the rear electric motor. The recuperation also works via both, but since most of the time the rear recuperation is enough, also this one is most often used for that. And the projected range, we saw also for the ENIAC and also for the Audi Q4 e-tron, it's the same right here with the bigger battery, 77 kilowatt hours net, approximately 400 kilometers of electric range and 250 miles. Now that's a very interesting perspective, isn't it? It starts, by the way, with a base suspension, which is already a little bit sportier. Optional, you can go 50 millimeters lower sport suspension, fixed one and optional, optional. DCC, dynamic chassis control, that's the adaptive suspension, then also with the sportier setup. It's also the one we're testing here today. Then you can also vary in the driving modes and the adaptive suspension adapts accordingly. In the rear, typical hatch look, but I think a very clean design that works very well. And the GTX gets these special accentuations right here. Overall, I think this GTX look works very well. Since we have the all-wheel drive here, maximum horsepower output of about, about 300 horsepower. Acceleration figure 6.2 seconds to 1 kilometers or 62 miles an hour. But to 60 kilometers an hour, that's interesting. Just three seconds because this instantaneous torque from the electric motor, so you're really quick, especially from the traffic light. We can also see a very cool tail lamp signature here, light strip all the way across the vehicle, and then at the sides here, this dot structure. Once again, really modern and playful. Here we are with the turning indicators, starting at the front and the rear. You also have them in a cascading style. And recharging 11 kilowatt AC and 125 kilowatt DC, well, that's not really DC leading, isn't it? And sadly, no frunk here whatsoever. 
Oh, and did you get that story where Volkswagen of America claimed to rename the whole brand to Volkswagen and they released it prior to April Fool's Day and everyone took it for granted, even the journalists and so on were reporting on it and then they later on said, yeah, you know, it's April Fool's. But they released it before April Fool's Day. So, yeah, I mean, first of all, if you do something like this, do it on April Fool's Day. Second is, April Fool's Day mm, in a world of fake news and lost trust in media and big corporations, maybe not the best idea unless it's super funny and super obvious. And the third factor, I mean, Volkswagen would have been such a great name, but either name the whole car that way, that would have been awesome, right? Hey, what do you have if you bought a Volkswagen? Or just use it as a proper marketing slogan, just like, this is the ID4, the Volkswagen. That would have been cool, you know? So use this, you know, super great coincidence, but don't make this April Fool's BS with it, right? Car key, kind of standard, like we know from the Golf. High gloss piano lecker, yeah, we know better stuff, definitely. Integrated door handle, good for aerodynamics. And then underneath you have some kind of feedback. Opening the door is a little bit special than here on the inside for the GTX or the all-wheel drive model here. Blue accentuation to the inside of the door, soft touch and red contrast stitches. The upper part is also soft touch, so that's good build quality. The only thing I don't like are these handles here for the side mirrors. And because you have to look at it, what you're doing, it's not that intuitive like the old school solution. Then the dashboard is also blue instead of black. That's also cool. And once again, soft touch and with red contrast stitches, really nice. And you have the steering wheel with GTI style, just in GTX then with a red accentuation and these really small digital instruments connected to the steering column. So more details to that. Lower part, GTX entry badge, and then these special seats. Well, first of all, the seats which come as standard still have a separate head restraint, but are already quite sporty, but we know them from the normal ID4. They come with fabric on the inside. These here, these sport seats, with integrated head restraint. They come with microfiber surface, really high quality and they look awesome. Both will deliver you good comfort. So it just depends on if you want to go for these here extra. So seats always animal free. Steering wheel, they are still working on the solution that you can get it animal free and still also use the travel assist, which is then here activated the steering wheel. Oh, and great joyful idea here, the brake and the throttle pedal with Play and pause. When you sit down and press the brakes, the screens get active and here you can see that the small screen moves along with the steering wheel and it's really tiny. This is for example different than in the Audi Q4 e-tron which has big virtual instruments. However, the reason that they kept this one here so simple and indeed you can really not switch much right here is the head-up display. It's an option, but they say, okay, now we have head-up display with augmented reality function, so we don't need big instruments anymore. That's their argument. And putting in the gears works like this, D or press it once more for B, this then higher recuperation while driving, or here then for reverse, and then you also have this rear view camera. Oh, and the music also pops on automatically. Thanks. And here the buttons, capacitive on the steering wheel, not so easy to control while driving. I know it looks fancy, I know it's also illuminated from the back, but still, real buttons would be easier to control, at least that's my opinion. Uh-oh, and I know this is a big fail for all our US viewers, especially here, two window levers in the front. Well, you can still control the rear, you just have to press rear then and then control them. Yeah, um, what do you think about that? Then the infotainment system, yeah, you have these sliders here for the temperature. That's again this capacitive curse. <laughs> the same also for the volume. Hey, we now call it capacitive curse. Then you have some hotkeys, for example, to access the climate menu. Then you can still, you know, change the temperature at least here. But I mean, if it's there or there, yeah, it's both shame. Yeah. <laughs> so, and then. Let's check out the rest of the infotainment system. 12 inch is an option, standard would be 10 inch. This is the bigger one. And they have meanwhile updated it a little bit. So it's a little bit faster, more responsive and has um, less fails. The earliest vehicles had more fails. Now it's not the most fancy infotainment system and you see it's also not the fastest, 
but since the latest upgrade, at least it's usable. So this is the main menu then here. And of course, then we also have the smartphone integration. And here we go, Apple CarPlay and Apple Auto also available with the wireless connection and the integration is well done. And the sound is actually very decent. Maybe it's the form of the vehicle and also, you know, this panoramic screen in the front that is, you know, giving us a good resonance. And what else is relevant when you hit the mode button here and you have the DCC, dynamic chassis control, the adaptive suspension, then you can pick the driving modes and then also the suspension acts accordingly. What about the voice input? Drive me to Berlin. That takes a while. Sorry, this is not currently possible. Please try again later. Okay, why? Middle console offers space for things and drinks. Here more things and here more drinks. And no, that's not a wine bottle. That's a water bottle actually, but in a wine niche style. <laughs> okay, and in here, smartphone, inductive charging, or then two USB-C supplies. And the cool thing is here for van-style traveling atmosphere, you have adjustable armrests. And one more look at the cockpit overview. Styling-wise, really clean. That's cool. However, the Audi Q4 e-tron is a little bit more exclusive and high in the build quality. And also the Skoda Enyaq, for example, I think it's just a little bit fancier, especially in the interior. And my biggest criticism point here is definitely this piano lacquer use also at the dashboard. Yeah, that should come a little bit classier. Or what's your take on that? And one more look here for the GTX model. Also the blue dashboard with the red contour stitches on the passenger side. And you can also see the ambient lighting. Put it to red here underneath this inserts and then here also the inside of the doors each. Seating position is upright, not too high though. I just recently drove the Audi Q4 e-tron. That one offers more like a higher SUV driving position. This one rather than a crossover style, but you could also just go higher with the seat. I mean, then you also get a more higher SUV seating position. That goes, that goes far, so. <laughs> That must look weird now, right? Um, but yeah, let's move it down, y'all. <laughs> so, and uh, then the headroom with one with 86 or 6 with 1 is like this. That's actually quite substantial. I usually put it a little bit higher like this, so really cool. And I found myself, you know, really comfortable here. It works both with the comfort seats and also with these optional sport seats. They are really very good. And one more capacitive curse CC <laughs> here for the roof cover. But glad we have one because otherwise it can get really hot inside here. Look at that, now it's all the way back and it's a huge panoramic screen. In some EVs you don't have the cover there, but here you can make it a little bit colder. It's cool in the rear, no middle tunnel, EV platform, temperature control and also two USB-C chargers. Same nice microfiber materials, by the way, and here for the rear seats if you pick that microfiber sport seats option. In this view, you can very well see the contrast between the blue and the black here. By the way, here, there's then hard pack at the rear doors and getting inside is really easy. And there's a very good seating position here in the rear. So a lot of leg room left here. One means a six and six with one headroom. It's close actually. Yeah, but still works for tall adults, but it's really comfortable here. And you have a lot of room and comfort. Once again here, due to the lacking middle tunnel, so great view through the panoramic roof. It's actually very well usable, so especially considering the length of that vehicle here, you have a lot of space on the interior. And then you also have some armrests right here with cup holes, but they are not adaptive, and also a ski hatch is available. Trunk area is 540 liters up to 1575 liters, or 19 cubic feet as we see it right now up to 56 cubic feet and the width about a meter or 40 inches and then you can also fold down the seats and this is then the maximum setup well these fellas are obviously very interested in our id4 gtx <laughs> or is it just the shade how sporty is the acceleration let's find out let's go Ooh, that's 100 kilometers an hour or 62 miles an hour. Yeah, really quick, great boost, especially in this really, really 
low speed area, you know, like this 0 to 60 kilometers an hour. That is really impressive. And especially like, you know, like on the first few seconds, you can almost beat any other petrol sports car with that. That's pretty cool. Then it gets a little bit slower bit by bit. So still rear rear biased, more power from the rear electric motor. A little bit less from the front one. The front one is not that powerful. And also the rear one is more efficient. And that's also the reason why they predominantly use the rear one. The front one then for these boost spikes, especially for, for these then, it doesn't run that often. So it really varies, but actually a good idea to do that. And you can still keep the rear wheel bias with that. However, if you go for the rear wheel drive only version, the only sporty advantage you have is that when you get out of the corners, you just have rear-wheel drive and the rear comes around a little bit better. Here you are, of course, also pulled from the front. So from a purest feeling, then the rear-wheel drive is better. But here, of course, you always have more punch and you are just quicker in any situation. It really depends on what's the more important to you. And of course, also, if you want to afford the extra price for that. In general, the steering is really great, very precise. That accounts for all the siblings here. Um, yeah, maybe the Skoda from the setup a little bit softer, the VW and the Audi a little bit crisper, but really good. So there's no dead zone area and you have very good feeling for the vehicle. Battery placed in the center of the vehicle as well, low center of gravity. So, I mean, it doesn't look that sporty on the outside, but still you have a great sporty driving fun. Here in the sports mode, the suspension is also quite stiff. I mean, there's some bumps in the road and I really feel them. So this is in the DCC and then you have a you know, astonishingly sporty setup here. So let's see how that changes when I go to the comfort mode. Then I immediately feel it gets softer. I'm not sure if you can even pick that up on camera, but you could really hear that it was louder from the bumps in the sports mode and now in the comfort mode these bumps are evened out even better so yeah it was maybe even a little bit annoying so i would stay in a comfort mode here and you can switch the sport mode then when you have a more even road but that's of course the cool thing you have that flexibility with the adaptive suspension in the sports mode then on you know very plain roads you can have a lot of fun and of course, in the comfort mode when it's a little bit bumpier. But what a beautiful road here, rape seat field here left next to us. Some of the trees going straight and straight. This looks really cool. German countryside here. And we are at the moment quite in the middle of Germany, by the way. Head up display, very well to read. And also when I'm getting towards the side of the road, sometimes it's showing me like some arrows that I'm supposed to keep it in the lane. It's also interesting. When I'm going slalom here at 70 kilometers an hour, again, bumpy road but that's great to test still the car is remaining very stable good to control there's no flexing of the chassis whatsoever so this platform is really superb and felt it with the q4 e-tron and also the skoda enyaq the enyaq the least sporty one from the feeling of these three siblings then this one here and the audi definitely feels sportier and then the id4 in general that other journals pro with the id4 was really fast hmm I I mean you know I'm no slouch as for driving fast but I tend to keep it a little bit more responsible that happened yeah live on of fuel definitely did I expose someone now hmm. sorry about that <laughs> back to our review right here I'm having a lot of fun driving the ID4 the e-tron the funny thing is on the one hand it felt sportier on the other hand you have to say the gtx model now of the id4 really adds this sporty touch with the sporty setup of the suspension and was told you in the interior part here in the id4 you feel you would sit a little bit lower than in the q4 e-tron and that again makes a little sportier feeling here with the id4 so seating position wise this is the sportiest one of all the siblings from the rest of the characteristics, I think rather the Audi, but this one here then comes really, really close. At the end of the day of these siblings, it's more about which one do you prefer styling-wise and also what concise offering do you get at the dealer. 
usually an Audi Q4 e-tron is around 3,000 euros more expensive in a similar spec than here, than the ID4. And here, by the way, when you go uphill, hitting the throttle, immediately there is acceleration. And wow, what great views we have here for you today. Really great to enjoy that together with you. And that's the cool thing about the orbit drive model. Even when you are already at speed, you always have more punch on the way. Here we go, now one kilometers an hour, 60 miles an hour, and it's quite windy than here in this open field, but noise insulation is still quite decent. However, there again, the Audi is more silent, definitely feel the Audi was like extremely silent. There may be some more cost savings here in comparison to the Audi, but then of course you also pay some more price. If we compare the Ford Mustang Mach-E, which is also a super interesting vehicle, and they already have that with the animal free whole interior, also the steering wheel. That's great with Ford. Um, as for the. Oh, stop. And here we go. Yes. Ooh, another 0 to 100 acceleration. Of course, I want to get in before the other cars hit us there. And that was also very well done. Have you seen? I mean, I was starting full throttle in a corner. That speaks for the vehicle, how everything is controlled. There was. No understeering, although I had full power on the front axle. Steering was great. There wasn't any traction loss, nothing. Absolutely flawless. And once again, that shows that electric all-wheel drive is just superior. There's no mechanical link whatsoever, front axle to rear axle. Everything is electronically controlled. And that's the reason why you can also fine tune it that way. So really very well done, both hardware, chassis-wise, and also software-wise, what they have done with that vehicle. And I think, I mean, why not use this new GTX tag for that? I think it brings a little bit more playfulness to the vehicle. By the way, the US market, most probably will not get the GTX batch. Not sure why they went for this decision. They just said it as the normal all-wheel drive model then. Yeah. Um, we have to see if it gets the same starting elements. I don't understand that decision. Why not making it just, you know, unified for all the different markets? That would have been better. Yeah, and range, uh, once again, of course, when you drive a little bit faster, when you have the overdrive model, you will lose some range. But in general, in summertime, for all the siblings, Audi Q4 e-tron, Skoda Enyaq, and also the VW ID4, with this bigger 77 kilowatt hour net battery, you will always end up somewhat 400 kilometers or 250 miles. You can score a little bit more when it's warm and you rather keep it steady, like 80 kilometers an hour, 50 miles an hour steady, and then you can drive further. Or when it's winter time or you constantly hit the throttle and drive really fast on the motorway, then of course range is dropping a little bit more. Heat pump is also available for this vehicle, by the way. And the top speed, depending if you go for an ID4 entry model, 160 kilometers an hour, or here the GTX, 180 kilometers an hour top speed. Exterior, interior, and driving of the Ionic 5 is this now the best electric vehicle as for price performance? We will find out. Look at that front, retro design, really awesome look, and the rectangular data running light, another spicy element, main headlamp unit comes from LED as standard. Ionic 5, yes, they also separated a little bit from the other cars, but still they carry the Hyundai badge. And here we can also see the full light signature at night here. And here in the rear. And the turning indicators here in the front. And here at the rear. Click, clack, click, clack. The length at 4 meters 63 or 182 inches. It's a mid-size segment, but a little bit shorter than other mid-size vehicles. This one will also be a little bit shorter than the platform brother, the Kia EV6. Important competitors, the Tesla Model 3 and the Polestar 2. Whereas this one here is more on this hatch shape. Very interesting difference also. Wheels from 19 to 20 inch. These here are the 20 inch wheels and they're more in this closed aerodynamic style, but really impressive and contrasting scheme around the wheel arches and also in the lower area right here. Just one suspension available, a basic steel suspension. There's no adaptive suspension or whatsoever. What do you think about the design here so far? And in the rear, they continue with this, I would call it retro tech design. Also here with the tail end signature. I just love it, like Knight Rider kid style, something like that. Contrasting elements in the lower end right here. 
there's one thing missing here in the rear. What could it be? Tell me in the comments and the solution later on when we are about to open the trunk. And some different colors for you. For example, this looks silver, but it's called Gravity Gold. Ooh. Or you could expect a light blue, but this one is called Teal Green. And if you look closely, yeah, it has some greenish something. And does it house a frunk? Yes, it does. And EV? Okay, now we all know that's an electric vehicle. <laughs> okay. And yeah, the space is somewhat limited in the frunk though. Hmm. And when we are here at the front, usually with combustion engines, we talk about the acceleration figures. Let's do it right now here because you have different models, rear-wheel drive or all-wheel drive. And if you have the rear-wheel drive model, the slowest one, 8.5 seconds. And the fastest one with all-wheel drive is 5.2 seconds in the acceleration figure. That's already quite quick then. And hey, what's in this optional bag here? And look at that. This is an adapter for the bi-directional charging. So this one here goes in there. And then we have a normal household plug end and you can, yeah, you know, charge anything outside, maybe for sports activities, uh, you know, maybe for your stand-up paddling board or something that you can put air in it or whatever. And two different battery sizes available, 58 kilowatt hours or 73 kilowatt hours, pricing then somewhat 40 to 50,000 euros or dollars depending on the battery size and rear-wheel drive or all-wheel drive, which one you pick. For the range, what does that mean? So with our testing consumption of something 18 kilowatt hours or more in kilometers or 27, 28 kilowatt hours on 100 miles with a small battery around 320 kilometers or 200 miles and for the bigger battery more than 400 kilometers or more than 250 miles. And now we'll start fast charging at a state of charge 71%. That's already quite a lot but the question is can it still charge quickly at this high state? And recharging, Hyundai promises 10 to 80% in less than 20 minutes with fast charging. First of all here, the charging flap, 11 kilowatt AC and maximum 220 kilowatt DC charging. And then you can here press it here to close it again, but we have a fast charger here now and 70% charge at the moment because we all know when you add like 10%, it does still quite well but what about the charging curve so we put it in here now the fast charger and what we can see here even at 75 percent of the battery state of charge more than 120 kilowatt that's extremely impressive hyundai says they developed their own fast charging technology right there and it's working very very well even here at this high state of charge very impressive so this is where they are leading at the moment together with porsche and audi who are using these RIMAC technology or RIMATS when you really call them that way. And now the charging power above 90% is here still at 40 kilowatt. Around with that, yeah, that's still quite decent. And when you are in a narrow parking situation like this, that's also a very interesting function. You can press the key fob here, the special hold button. And when you held it for a couple of seconds and you hear the AC is running, that's the only sign and then you can press the forward key here and then the car comes alive and then you can let it drive out magic but uh, you know sometimes you you know you need some practice that it actually works when it's working it's working really nicely and flawlessly that's it and here now I can get inside but uh, for this take I need it a few times actually to show that to you perfectly <laughs> This is the car key, good quality, and when you open it, then the door handles come towards you. They're otherwise integrated like this, and door closing sound is really solid like that. Inside of the doors, soft touch already in the top part, not too soft though. Here also somewhat soft, real soft is in here, and it's kind of a floating design. And also interesting new materials right here. So this is indeed fancy, but a very slim door pocket right there. The Bose sound system right here has an illumination also at night around there and the Ionic 5 entry badge. Nice floor mats also and this is high trim by the way. The steering wheel also with an interesting fabric-like material here on the inside where the airbag pops out. Now everything is kind of shut down. Soon we'll also light that up and then you see everything with the steering wheel and so on. Two times 12 and 3 inch screens at the moment shut off also soon more to that and then the seats they would start with black fabric that's the best choice to go this is the optional animal skin pack of course it doesn't make sense for any sustainable car and it's of course not animal friendly and also you can see here 
I mean, these are early prototype vehicles, yes, but still, I'm not sure if that will be different later on. We have to check that in, at a later stage. Oh, by the way, this here is just a magnet, so you can uh, just take that off and you have a cleaner look. <laughs> Seating position is kind of like compact hatch style, I would say. Then steering wheel, manual up and down and also in and out. And headroom here with one wheel A6 or six with one. Still plenty left, although there is already this panoramic roof and it, it opens in a very interesting way. Look at that very soon. But here, I mean, the seating comfort is somewhat okay, but it's also not a special comfort, I would say. And here we go. That's really fancy, right? So the split opening from the middle, but then the whole thing cannot be opened. Interior overview here with this clean dual screen setup and a bright layer. This is quite rare. Usually you have black bezels here. They went for a different design right here. This is then also soft touch. And I really like the clean layout they have here. But the user interface, is it the best? Mm, kind of not. You have the volume knob still, but then, for example, the climate dials are here with these capacitive buttons. And the question is again, why? At least they're separated here and not kind of like integrated in the screen or something. Then you still have some hotkeys here, for example, to hop to the map or the, um, you know, the navigation directly than here when you put in the search and so on. Zoom on to the infotainment system. Putting in the gears is here, front or reverse. That's actually quite simple and easy. And also the steering wheel has capacitive buttons. It's just one field. Yeah, it's a curse in the automotive industry, really. And they also fell for it, actually. The driving mode selector, however, that's actually an easy choice here. And also with a nice feedback. And the digital instruments, and that's where we, for example, change the driving mode. And they're actually clear to read. You have the speed right there and also then the projected range on the right side. You have a nice head-up display. It's a good option. And also with some GPS integration if you have a root set infotainment system. You might expect with the modern charging technology that they went for something modern in the infotainment system, but they didn't. So. The standard Hyundai Kia infotainment system, you know, it's a little bit wider, but it's nothing. I mean, our smartphones were far further, you know, like five years ago. So um, this is not living up to the standard of this vehicle at all. This is quite responsive here in the main menu, like this climate menu is right here, but everything takes time and it's not good in the overview. So the user interface is just too complicated here, I think. So best is to take Apple CarPlay and that auto, and this integration is awesome. One of the best integrations using all the way of the screen. One of the best integration we've seen here with the Apple CarPlay and the Bose sound system also delivers a very great true sound. And the rear view camera with a great resolution, also the helping lines adapt accordingly. Right side fake drone view from above. And when you then switch to the driving mode again, like this, you have the visualization of the vehicle. It's of course all digitalized and now you can take a look at what you're doing to the wheels and so on. The lower area is interesting, USB charger, 12 volt power supply, and then they have this open space using the EV platform, I like that. Then you have two cup holders, adaptive and more charging possibilities, two times USB-A and also inductive charging pad. So the car internal infotainment system, CarPlay integration, Yay! Still offering animal skin seats, but the offering of space and the roomish concept, this is awesome. Showing you this here, see another perspective here, we have space in the open front. Finally, someone is using that in the AV. And then here, a lot of space also underneath with the armrest, and you can put this whole thing up, and this is really awesome. I mean, you can put like large handbags here, maybe even a backpack or something. So this is actually very well executed. The rear doors are super large, very long, but that also gives a good access to the rear than here. Then inside of the doors here, also soft in the rear, rarely see that. Also here with a manual shade. Overall, the quality of materials are actually quite good, also with the buttons and so on. I really like these inserts right here, for example. Then you can see once again, EV platform, no middle tunnel or something. That's again, very well used, USB chargers. Seats again with the animal skin spec in black. And let's see, when I'm in the driving position in the front, well, that's a very good result. A lot of space in the rear. This is not a long vehicle, but the usage of space here, enormous. So really super spacious here. It's not a long vehicle at all, but that is really impressive. So 
Uh, would be even better if the seat would be a little bit higher, then you can put your feet better underneath it at, in the rear. It's very comfortable and also enough headroom, so very impressive by the rear result. Then you can also put this angle here a little bit steeper or more in this you know, laying back position. And it's so easy to switch here also to the middle position. So five tall adults is an easy exercise here for the Ionic 5. Well, and the bi-direction charging, of course, also works on the inside here. Normal household plug, for example, to charge MacBooks and so on. And this is really practical because there's a lot of space around it. Usually it can be a problem, like especially with these chargers, but here, no problem. So did you solve the riddle what this car does not have in the rear? Yes, you're right. It does not have a rear wiper. Hmm. Can you live without one? Tell me in the comments. Then let's open that hatch. 500 liters up to 1,600 liters approximately. Wide opening, easy access to the trunk. And then, well, this cover here is a little bit wobbly and it's also not high enough. I'll soon show you. But the rest of the trunk is actually quite well usable with a meter or 40 inches length, almost a meter or 40 inches. So that's totally okay. But it's actually quite shallow, so I, I can show you that with a backpack. So when I put the backpack right here, yeah, that's hmm, not that good. So maybe just put this whole thing out. So I would probably use this vehicle then without this because. So the problem of this trunk is the height, 15 inches or 40 centimeters to the cover here. The overall height in the back, that is actually quite okay when we're here at about 30 inches or 80 centimeters. But look at that here, you know, in the front, you cannot put the backpack right there. You have to at least push it in like this and then you have to cover. So yeah, I think my solution would be putting stuff more back in and also removing this whole thing and magic all the way to the length here, about 70 inches or 180 centimeters. That's again, well usable in length. Welcome to the driving part of the Ionic 5 and we start here in busy Valencia city traffic. It's a good way to find out more about the recuperation and you can switch it around here actually with the shifting pedals. Level zero would be you lift the throttle, the car is rolling. Then with the left pedal you can increase the recuperation. Level one, level two, level three and this is already when I lift the throttle. A strong recuperation, so strong braking then to gain back the energy and one more so-called eye pedal and this is then the strongest recuperation and this is then the one pedal driving feeling so when I lift foot of throttle here I, I leave it a little bit even while rolling then I stand still and this way I can really just drive with the throttle pedal and I hardly ever use the brake pedal just in the emergency situation where I really really need it. What you also realize is when you're here stuck in city traffic, this open space surrounding here, you know, where everything has a lot of room, this really helps also in narrow city traffic because when everything around you feels kind of caged in and narrow, but here on the inside, everything feels spacious, that's a very, very good feeling. And also how everything resonates here from the switch gear and so on, when you touch, for example, the turning indicator, really good build quality and that also helps here while driving to feel somewhat just you know well and somewhat also sophisticated it's also not too big for our vehicle so in the city traffic you really feel at home and you can also easily get a parking spot and so on and so on so for city good vehicle actually and then you also have advantages if you compare it to really big EVs for example and noise insulation here so far also very good. It's a very silent and calm atmosphere. And of course, the electric driving when I don't have any engine sound also contributes to that. Usually I would leave it with the iPedal, with the one pedal driving feeling. I think just for the electric vehicles, it's a more suitable thing. And it's also a safety thing, I always say, because when you lift your foot off the throttle, you immediately begin with the deceleration and you don't have to switch from the throttle pedal to the brake pedal. Even already here in the city you can by the way use the assistance systems and for example the lane keeping assist and I don't even have to activate the cruise control for that so um, yeah maybe not here in the, in the you know fastest band or something but I, I feel that this assistance system can be activated here at the steering wheel is already active keeping me in the lane 
even at slower speeds. That's also interesting. But at any time, you can also deactivate it here directly at the steering wheel. Whee! <laughs> the acceleration here in the city that was kind of like 0 to 50. And that's it. And since we have the all-wheel drive model here, boost from both engines, still it has a uh, rear-wheel bias. So because it's a rear-wheel platform, if you have just one motor, you have just the rear-wheel drive. And this way here in the all-wheel drive, the rear motor is still the strongest one. I have the top all-wheel drive model here, which is at 5.2 seconds in the acceleration to 1 km or 62 miles an hour. That is really impressive. So. I mean, this car doesn't make the sportiest appearance or something. Also doesn't feel sportiest as for, you know, driving feel and so on. But then it has this boost of power. That's really amazing. However, the steering here is actually really precise and feels very good. So there's no dead zone area, very precise commands. Suspension wise, there is just one suspension available. It's a normal steel suspension, no adaptive suspension available or something. But so far it's doing a good job. It's not laid out too soft. We have that quite a lot of times that with the electric vehicles they are rather a little bit stiffer or so. But actually so far I'm, I'm very happy with that. Driving modes are also available here at the steering wheel. In the sport mode, eco mode, normal mode. This really has an effect on the throttle input for example. And let's see, steering, that's any different in the sport mode. Yeah, in the sport mode gives you a little bit more feedback. That's actually quite nice as well. But it does not change the horsepower or something. We know that from, for example, from, from the small Peugeot electric vehicles that they really reduce horsepower in the eco driving modes and then they boost horsepower in the sport mode. This is not the case here. So the acceleration in the normal mode and in the sport mode will be just the same. Just that the throttle pedal is reacting more spontaneously in the sport mode. Yeah, I mean, more or less, you can just leave it then in the normal mode and that's it and you'll be just fine with that. Now we are getting on the motorway. See also more about the acceleration when we are already at speed. So I'll wait till the exit and we can then accelerate up to 100. So I do now five, uh, 50 kilometers to 100. Let's go. Plop, that's it. So even that, really quick. I mean, the all-wheel drive model, yes, the strongest one here. Do you really need it? It's the most fun in acceleration, but you'll also be just fine with some of the less strong versions because they're really so powerful. Eye pedal here, getting off the throttle. Car's getting in front of me. Directly good recuperation, no problem at all. And noise insulation here at one kilometers or 60 miles an hour still fairly good so actually oh, i think i have to stay here sorry about that yeah but <laughs> that also shows this car is really also flexible as for the lane changing again quite stable from suspension at the same time good comfort and really a lot of fun to steer it around so the driving fun factor with this vehicle is really very very good and the elect that is electric just contributes to that a very spontaneous reaction I can easily also live with the rear-wheel drive. We also have that in the Tesla Model 3 where we compared all-wheel drive to the rear-wheel drive. Of course, you have always more punch with the all-wheel drive versions, but then the rear-wheel drive versions, they seem to just come around in the corner a little bit more because you are just getting pushed from the rear and that's it. And that can be sometimes just be a better feeling. Wow. <laughs> this is really great. There's also... Um, this, uh, this special head-up display, which is showing me arrows in my line of sight. That's also very helpful, especially here in this situation. Even when looking at the map here, I wouldn't have seen like, okay, would it be the left or the right lane? But then in the head-up display, it was showing me like, a, like an arrow in this direction. And then I know, ah, okay, it's the right lane here. So without the somewhat augmented reality head-up display function here, I wouldn't really have known which way to take by that I did actually know so that's indeed very very helpful of course we're now a little bit higher in the energy consumption since with that did this you know acceleration test but we can also zero it out and see what kind of result do we score actually 
when we zero it out and keep it rather steady here on the motorway and let's see about that that could also be something of the um, you know yeah, minimum energy consumption and here at the moment here on the motorway of course the AC is running because it's kind of hot outside yes but here now let's see we wait a little bit until we get you know, you know a better result but you know in our test so far with this vehicle here we were always about 17 somewhat kilowatt hours and more kilometers that's 27 kilowatt hours on 100 miles and approximately the same thing we have been, we've been showing right here and this also happened for the Polestar 2 just the Tesla Model 3 was indeed more efficient as for this respect and I think that's also still the case that the Tesla electric motors are just more efficient that's where they're still ahead and that's also why they have advantages as for the range here then however probably be a little bit more range with the Polestar 2 but overall these competitors are all somewhat close once again I mean there are a lot of cars around us here as well and I think it's rather relatively silent in here a high-speed test is yet to be done so at a later stage we will also get this vehicle here in Germany take to the German motorway and really flow it out 200 kilometers an hour or 125 miles an hour see about that of course please subscribe to our channel if you want to keep updated with these videos this one here and our, our first driving test today and so far I'm actually quite impressed with the driving very positive aspect all the way like steering suspension acceleration calmness here in the interior how everything is being built and you touch and you see while driving that's really good infotainment system wise once again the inbuilt map not too good to see but definitely take the head-up display this is really helpful first of all for checking the speed because here also it's sometimes a little bit blocked while driving but then also for these GPS arrows you see they are very very helpful so if there's one option you should actually go for to me the head-up display it would actually be and once again lane change a lot of fun feels super flexible and agile so all the hardware stuff they've done here is really really convincing of course we all talked about the charging infrastructure and the whole stiffness of the chassis and so on everything we say today will basically also count for the Kia EV6 because they are sharing the same platform and of course it just makes sense that they do so because they develop this charging um, you know this charging technology for both vehicles uh, there is the blind spot monitor, monitor by the way you have to have this this small triangle in the side mirror and when you set the turning indicators it also flashes that's helpful but we've seen better integrations of the blind spot monitor it's not too obvious I think and yeah maybe should have been bigger or maybe like you know in a, in a curved way something like this that would have been more helpful than the small triangle we see here right now so we had city traffic and also autobahn and in both cases that was really really convincing and here now about 120 kilometers an hour so about 70 miles an hour still very stable on the road and noise insulation wise we're not picking up any disturbing wind noise anywhere so even at this speed which would be the maximum speed here in Spain also on the motorway uh, these on the motorways in Spain I know <laughs> so this is still a very good result and I mean when the motorways here are a little bit more curvy that's also reason why the speed is not too high and then also in this area it's really a lot of fun once again to steer this car around oh by the way I'm not sure if you see that here when I have the left turning indicator on the motorway I have like the camera from the side mirror and right again here and this is another blind spot helper so when I use the right turning indicator small camera image appears from the right side next to me also a great safety feature we uh, we've known that recently from the Genesis G80 uh, this was a very interesting feature and so what you see here also the, the top luxury cars they have inside the corporation also this vehicle here which is not top luxury class but more in the price performance EV segment still receives all the big tech stuff they have available by the way here since we drove a little bit faster on the motorway 
consumption now went up around 22, 23 kilowatt hours on one kilometer. So that would be more than definitely way more than 30 kilowatt hours on one miles. So we see that on higher motorway driving, where Tesla even has more advantage because the Tesla consumption does not go up that much when you drive a little bit faster on the motorway at the Polestar 2 and here also for the Ionic 5 and also for the Kia EV6. That is actually the case. And then here, our range with the big battery for constant, you know, like 120 kilometers or 70 miles. Now our motorway driving would be less than 400 kilometers or less than 250 miles. So is it now the best electric vehicle in the price performance sector out there now? It's a very, very good electric vehicle. But to me, it's not the best because infotainment system wise, the Polestar 2 and the Tesla Model 3 are definitely way ahead. Tesla, of course, also with the supercharging infrastructure and also with the efficiency of the electric motors. This one here, however, very good in the charging technology. That's where it is actually ahead. And overall, a very, very good package they're offering. Hey, this is Thomas. And today I have for you the Audi Q4 e-tron, mid-size electric SUV. This platform, by the way, is shared by the VW ID4 and the Skoda Enyaq. They have some similarities, but they're also quite different. And this one is very interesting, I can promise. And also to come later in this review, SUV versus the Sportback version. Design exterior, functionality interior, and also the driving part, rear-wheel drive versus all-wheel drive. So we start with everything you need to know in the front. A closed grille right here and also in the lower part. There's a little bit of cooling, but it's adaptive on the inside. Pretty interesting. Then the Audi rings are two-dimensional because they hide the sensors behind it for adaptive cruise control and so on. Front view camera is possible. Navara blue is the color for today, but there are of course other color choices available. And interesting is optional matrix LED lamps. We also have them right here. And the daytime running light signature can be changed from inside the vehicle so you can already individualize your car electronically. So that Jonas could film the daytime running light signatures from the outside. I practiced on the inside using two fingers so you can confirm faster. Yes, daytime running light, action. <laughs> ah. Hey, and we have cascading turning indicators. We also find them in the rears. Actually, even a safety feature, I think, because you can just better see when someone is turning. I know you love comparisons here. You can see the S-Line on the Sportback. Of course, you can go with the S-Line, with the colors, front-wheel drive, all-wheel drive. Doesn't matter if SUV or Sportback, but to see the difference here, the S-Line here has this additional contrast right there. And also in the front grille, you can see here these chrome-like accentuations, whereas here it's more subtle. So, normal design or S-Line, what's your pick? And by the way, colors, Navara blue and here the Giza blue. This is here, 4 meters 59 or 181 inches for the length. And the wheels go from 19 to 21 inch. These here, gold middle, 20 inch. I think pretty cool look. Here we have painted wheel arches, but you can also get in a crossover style, for example, in painted black or so, depending on the trim level. I think the side profile, definitely very interesting, rather upright here for the SUV building style and an interesting design line right here. You can also get the Sportback version, which is a cut-off version, a little bit more aerodynamic styling right here in this SUV coupe shape and also a little bit better as for the wind efficiency, but it's more about the styling. Also, when we come to the interior later, not too much difference. Really about the styling, SUV or SUV Coupe, which one would you actually pick? Technology-wise, very interesting that this is rear-wheel driven, the platform and the car. Also, the very one we have here today, where we can pick all-wheel drive or rear-wheel drive. I rather tend to pick the rear-wheel drive models, you know, because of the racing, you know. <laughs> and 40 e-tron is the name of the rear-wheel drive model before it gets out here. Light strip all the way across the vehicle, cool design feature. So this version here, 200 horsepower, rear wheel drive, 8.5 seconds in the acceleration figure, or you can go all wheel drive model, one electric motor in the rear, one in the front, around 300 horsepower and six seconds, the acceleration figure, so definitely quicker. But this one has the advantage of a smaller turning circle and also you get out of the corners a little bit quicker. Battery sizes, 
either a small one, 52 kilowatt hours net, or this one here today, 77 kilowatt hours net, and then a projected range around about 400 kilometers or 250 miles, you will need that. So, rear wheel drive and big battery, that's my tip for today, and that's exactly the car I have for you. Well, I prefer the rear wheel driven version, not only because you come a little bit sporty out of the corners, but also due to the smaller turning circle. 10.2 meters, the smallest of an Audi vehicle ever, smaller than with the Audi A1. And you can literally also see that. Disc brakes in the front and drum brakes in the rear. Same for the Enyaq and also the ID4. And you might think, oh, well, it's 2021, drum brakes in the rear, what's that? Cost saving and so on. Well, it also has an advantage because there's then less corrosion for the disc brakes. The electric vehicles hardly ever use the rear brakes because of the recuperation. So I think actually it's a clever choice to go for drum brakes in the rear. Here now, the comparison SUV versus the Sportback, you can see here the roof line is falling right there. More central, sportier. I think it's really well done. So at first I was thinking, ah, more SUV, but the more I see the Sportback, yeah, I really fall in love with the coupe design right here. So yeah, really cool as for this really agile form. Audi expects two thirds of SUV sales, one third of Sportback sales. But the question is, which one would you go for? And the rear comparison, SUV, Sportback, once again, split here with the wing, and then there's glass underneath, glass above. Yeah, just a sporty look, once again, for the Sportback and the SUV. I'm really looking forward to your feedback, which do you find more beautiful? Usually I would tend to the SUV version, but here for the Q4 e-tron, I think I would maybe go with the Sportback. Sadly, there is no frunk. I know electric vehicle lovers love their frunks. You don't have anyone here, but, it's also built in Germany, by the way, in that Zwickau plant, just where the ID4 is being built. And recharging, 11 kilowatt AC for the bigger battery and 125 kilowatt DC. Not too much, actually. And the smaller battery, but not too many people will go for the smaller battery. It's even a little bit slower in the figures. Just to mention, there will also be an entry-level version, by the way, with 170 horsepower for the small battery version. And standard suspension will just be a normal one. And then option you can go for sport suspension or, which we have today, the adaptive suspension, which is giving you the best comfort and also more variety between sportiness and you know, rather soft feeling. Now, towards the interior, there's the key. Simple, straightforward, nice. Then, door closing sound. Mmm, top notch, like that. And inside of the doors is somewhat just soft on the top part, not too soft, not entirely hard. And this is then entirely hard, and this again soft. So not too happy with the inside of the doors. That could be better. But here the door handles, they're actually quite cool. And also the buttons we have here, click, click. Nice clicking sounds. And the bottles here, top part, and lower part, so two spaces for bottles, for water bottles, that's actually quite nice. In the interior right here, this new steering wheel, there's also a different one available, but this one is the, you know, the shiny steering wheel because it has these flat ends. And it's really good to grab it also here on the top part when you're in a, you know, like sharp corner or something in the city. So it's really nice visually and also to handle it. However, here not too happy with the 2D Audi rings. It is, you know, some, Part is really metal in there, but it's you know it's just two-dimensional, and I like it when it's three-dimensional. Then look at that, the capacitive buttons on the steering wheel. You can slide or click. Also has good clicking sound and four capacitive solutions. It's cool, but again, single individual buttons were just better. Everyone agrees to that, don't you as well? Then seats, either a normal seat or a sport seat, and different services available. There are two different fabric seats available if you want to keep it animal free. Here, this is the mainly leatherette seat, so mainly animal free, but just here, the inside bolsters here on the lower part, this is then from animal origin, so not quite consistent. The same with the Dynamica seat. Dynamica then on the inside, so a microfiber material, 
and then just the outside balls are some animal parts. At least they're moving in the right direction, even if they're not as consistent as, for example, um, Tesla or also the ID4, you know, from Volkswagen, the sibling here, is a little bit more consistent in these choices. And what else is good? They use recycling share, already here, for example, also with the microfiber seat and even more so in the fabric seat. So they're also putting more recycling share and also more renewable energy production, for example, in the plant where this car is being produced. So steering wheel here, up and down, in and out. That's good. The Audi virtual cockpit here in this vehicle is smaller, you can see, than we used to know. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, it looks cool, but we, we just know the 12.3 inch, which is a little bit wider. That makes a better impression. But at least this one here, I think, is way cooler than the one we see in the ID4, this really tiny uh, thing, you know. And we'll soon also have a head up display special, which is quite impressive. Seat ergonomics is actually decent electric control and you have a good upright seating position, some SUV feeling, not as high as you might know from an Audi Q5. This one then rather goes like SUV crossover direction seating wise, I think. Of course, you can put the seat a little bit higher. Best seating comfort will be with the fabric seats because it adapts to the body a little bit better. But overall, interesting seating position, really long here from the you know, front hood, rather panoramic atmosphere. But definitely you, you feel at home here and to me the most important thing is you have one very crucial difference to the ID4 coming up right now. And here we are with the interior overview. Left side these 10.25 inch instruments, talked about them. On the right side either 10.1 or this one here 11.6. This is the bigger one. And we know this basic menu structure like this, so rather keep it with that. That's also easy, we know it from Audi, and then you can control everything here, for example, the car function, lights and vision. That's where I actually picked the exterior lighting and here with a digital light signature. That was quite funny, definitely. Then the GPS also has a satellite view, if you like. And we're in the northern part of Germany at the moment, at the German Baltic Sea. That's a very beautiful area. Just too bad it's really cold and sometimes rainy today, but beautiful here also with the whole GPS. And you see, the software is also with the CPU in the background. It's fast enough. That's definitely better also than with the ID4. And optional Sonos sound system. First time they work together with Sonos. And wow, the sound is superb, really. Amazing. Great depth of the sound. I can just recommend it. Really cool. My favorite feature for today here, this matte wood insert. Just listen to this. Ah. <sighs> beautiful and it doesn't collect any fingerprints and it always feels kind of warm maybe also because of the heat of the infotainment system so in cold days <laughs> yeah that's awesome then now my favorite feature in comparison to the id4 climate control first of all click 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 audi sound design for clicking buttons and you can still manual control it while driving that's so much easier than all the capacitive bs Really good to have that here. That would be my number one reason to go for this one, not for the ID4 or the Skoda Enyaq. Then drive select in the lower part. This is not that easy to reach, but I can already tell you from driving, it doesn't have the biggest effect on driving, so rather leave it on the auto mode and then you don't need that button anyway. This is here for the passenger to swipe the volume. Yeah, don't tell your passenger, just do it from your steering wheel. <laughs> And then here with the drive selector, drive mode, B mode for more recuperation, also easily switched it. And here more space like a flying console, two USB-C choices. And the smartphone can also go for Apple CarPlay and out in a wireless way, but I tend to keep it with the cable old school yo. Then adaptive cup holders, it's also good from build quality. And then we have this armrest right here, well attached. Can put it longer and also more space underneath. And here in the optional head-up display, you get a lot of information, current speed, allowed speed, and also here when you should lift your foot off the throttle already, for example, because here the roundabout is about to come. And of course, one of the best things it has to offer is actually the augmented reality function. And there you see them now, they are the arrows, and here, so the top part, the arrow shows me 
directly the first exit of the roundabout. Here we go. By the way, if you have the smaller 10.1 inch screen here, you just have bigger bezels. The screen is a little bit smaller than. However, same CPU, same software, just the screen size differs. Yeah, that's just Audi extra price policy. And this screen, the biggest one, is only available a couple of months after sales start of this vehicle. Time code, Thomas in the back seat. Check it out. Here, some soft touch right there, but once again, hard pack here at these doors. Yeah, but at least some Sonos speakers if you have that option. So you already can see a lot of space in the rear still. It's not the longest vehicle, but since it's the EV platform, no middle tunnel also, and a lot of space on the back seats. It's making actually a quite good impression. And leg room here when I'm driving with 186 or 601, sufficient headroom both front and the rear and also leg room. So very well used this space here and also quite comfortable to sit here. It's actually good. Also in the middle part, two USB-C chargers, 12 for power supply and the climate control. And once again, by the way, so this is mainly leather red, so animal free. And you can see here, it's really soft, um, feels very good. You could not tell the difference right here. More features, adaptive cup holders, that's good build quality, definitely. And then we can already fold the seats from here, if you like. So is there any difference in headroom, SUV versus coupe? <laughs> Let's check it out. Yeah, yeah, a li little bit, a little bit. So I have to now like squeeze my hand a little bit in. Yes. Yeah, indeed. So it was like, like this versus this approximately. So, yeah, I mean, it works still with one meter 86 or 601. You can easily sit with tall adults. You're also in the rear of the coupe version of the Sportback. Yeah, just a little compromise, but once again, not much of a compromise. You can easily go for the Sportback for the coupe if you like the design better. And now the trunks, because we have both SUV and Coupe directly next to each other, around 500 to 1,500 liters in the capacity. The Coupe even has a little bit more, but you can hardly see a difference. And the good thing is, here usually the Coupes are a little bit, you know, smaller right here in this dimension, but it's not the case right here. You can see it's high enough. And when you directly switch here, Coupe to the SUV, I mean, don't we see a big difference? Backpack maybe pushing a little bit inside and that's it. There's also this you know, nice net right here. You can secure things and underneath there's a storage for your charging cable. And to fold the seats, you have to go around and then you can also load the thing through. Yeah, just around the one meters 80 then in the total length. But definitely, if you go for the SUV or the Coupe, it's not design versus practicability. It's just design versus design. Zero to 60 kilometers an hour, uphill, while raining, full throttle, really great traction, so it was a very good acceleration test. The rear-wheel drive only model here, more than enough power, so again, considering it was an uphill acceleration, very well done. And now when we're getting on the motorway, 80 to 120 kilometers an hour, so that's a good like acceleration progress. Here we go. So that's again reasonable. Around eight seconds is the official acceleration figure and six seconds is something, the overdrive version. So it's 200 versus 300 horsepower. But here I really have to say, this horsepower output is actually enough. And I think it's still the best combination. Big battery, but the rear drive only version has the advantage. You have a more narrow turning circle. So the turning circle of this vehicle at 10.2 meters that's a smaller turning circle than the Audi A1, the smallest turning circle in the Audi lineup. Definitely very interesting. And also very good here that it's raining at the moment. Not that it's pleasant outside, but we can even better test, you know, the, NV, uh, um, the NVH. So like what's the noise level and so on. Yeah, limited visibility. Thank you so much, Q4 e-tron. I didn't see it was limited visibility. <laughs> yeah, about that. So what, what my point is, noise insulation, superb. It's very silent in here, although it's raining cats and dogs outside. 
Um, yeah, we'll get a little bit lighter now here though. And also like the, the rolling from the tires and so on, super silent in here. At the same time, steering, very precise, very sporty here with the flat top and bottom. So it feels very sporty. At the same time, it's a comfortable drive. You have a more or less upright seating position. So the ergonomics of the seats, also very good. So I'm really feeling at home here on the motorway and I've driven to this test drive here in the Audi RS Q8, which is of course segment bigger and that also offers good comfort, of course. But here, it's not that I would feel so much less comfort, although it's a little bit smaller, you know, more in this mid-size segment here. So really, really happy that we have comfort, at the same time, good sporty driving feelings. And it's good that the electric motors, the torque is instantaneously, it's directly there, and therefore it's still also suitable for the motorway journeys. If you want more power, then go for the all-wheel drive version. But for most cases, this one here will also be just fine. And yeah, I really have to say, I feel one with the vehicle. Some kind of traveling feeling because, you know, it's like really long to the front windshield. That's create, creating some, definitely some, some traveling van style feel, so to speak. But again, due to the low center of gravity, battery is placed in the center of the vehicle. It feels very, very sporty. So on the outside, typical Mitzel SUV style. Okay, the sport bag looks a little bit sportier, but definitely once again, it drives sportier than it actually looks. And that's a lot of fun and still safe traveling here also in the rain. And it's only rear wheel driven. It's actually no problem as long as you keep all the stability systems in place. It's no problem at all. And it, I mean that, you know, you can leave it in the auto mode and go efficiency, comfort and dynamic in dynamic mode, for example. You have a little bit more throttle input, the steering and so on. Everything reacts a little bit differently, but it doesn't make the biggest difference. So let's see, we drop a little bit speed in dynamic mode. Okay. And then let's see, comfort mode. It went back to the auto again, right? So wait a minute, comfort mode. Okay, got that. Now dynamic mode. Let's see the difference. Jonas? Not too much, right? Yeah, so that's probably more than with the with the petrol engines in general, because in the dynamic modes, they're going in the lower gear, for example. Some electric vehicles also vary the horsepower output about, uh, over these driving modes, but here, it didn't make a big difference, at least when we are already at speed. Might be a little bit different than when we start just from, from the get-go. As for the energy consumption, of course we have the acceleration um, included now, but a good average is some 17 kilowatt hours and 100 kilometers or 27 kilowatt hours and 100 miles. So that again confirms my prediction of around 400 kilometers or 250 miles of electric range. There's no other range <laughs> for this vehicle here. And I think that's still quite, quite reasonable, but also shows you have to go with the biggest battery with this vehicle. Otherwise the range will, for a lot of use cases, be not enough. But as a traveling vehicle here, it's really very well done. Comparing it to the VW ID4, it definitely feels more premium as we talked about in the interior. You know, I just love this matte wood area here we have in this trim. It also feels a little bit more sophisticated by driving. It feels to me also a little bit sportier. So you can of course go like from, from, from the S-Line always and so on. And here when you have the adaptive suspension, we have here the dynamic or adaptive suspension has the possibility to do it a little bit stiffer then or a little bit softer once, once again. But the general setup of this vehicle to me feels a little bit sportier than the ID4 without giving you less com um, less comfort or something. So I think just steering setup, suspension, the whole handling dynamic is really perfect. So they really nailed it here with this vehicle. And as I said, also the noise insulation, very, very cool. And when we're getting, yeah, once again, limited visibility, well, now it's actually better, definitely, right?
<laughs> yeah, one more thing. First of all, once again, driving dynamics also just from startup. Really cool. So much fun. Didn't expect this vehicle to be so much fun. That's really cool. And about recuperation. That part was missing. So either in normal D mode, the car is just rolling here, down and out. And then I can also switch to the B mode. Then I'm not doing anything more recuperation. And I would recommend using the B mode just fits more to the electric vehicles and also in the moment you switch from the throttle to the brake pedal before you would do that you lift your foot on the throttle and there's already deceleration happening so I think it's also a matter of safety and you just get used to it when driving electric vehicles it's not that they would set it on the strongest recuperation ever so they rather have this rolling philosophy and they want then customers to use recuperation by using the brake pedal you can argue pro and con for that I'm more a fan of harder recuperation when you lift the throttle than as soon as you get used to the one pedal driving feeling, you just you know feel happy with that. But here they rather want, let's say, existing Audi customers not to feel irritated too much, transition to the electric vehicles and rather say you drive it more a little, a little bit with the brake pedal, you know. So yeah, what, what do you think about that actually? And you can also um, change the recuperation here with the brake pedals when you are you know in the D mode then you can go a little bit higher or a little bit lower so that's possible as well and now comparison with the all-wheel drive model 300 horsepower fast acceleration let's see how it goes Whee! there was 0 to 80 kilometers an hour pretty quick and Definitely you feel you just have more punch here with the all-wheel drive model. Yeah, but you also realize that the turning circle is a little bit wider. This is the rear view camera here, by the way. Very good to have that, of course. In the US models, it's always standard because of the regulations. In Europe, you have to pay extra. And here, yeah, definitely feel the rear wheel drive model is yeah, a little bit more, a little bit lighter to control. Definitely when you have narrow turning circle and so on. Yeah, but you just have more punch definitely here also in the dynamic mode. That's definitely cool. So acceleration wise, when you hit the throttle, definitely more sportiness from the all-wheel drive model. But then when getting out of the corners and so on, the rear-wheel drive model somehow just feels more purist, you know? In any case, the steering is super direct and precise. Really love that. Even more so sporty response in the dynamic mode. So you really have to think about, of course, how much money are you willing to invest? The 300 horsepower version is just a little bit more cost intensive. Yeah, I mean, here now 70 to 100. That's it. That's so much more coming from the acceleration. So this is a huge difference. If acceleration is important for you, then you should pick the dual uh, motor. If price is more important to you and you know, you want to have a little bit more sporty driving fun out of the corners, then the rear wheel drive model is the one for you. And top speed difference, 160 kilometers an hour versus here, 180 kilometers an hour. So it's a difference of 100 miles per hour to 112 miles per hour. Yeah, that's probably also a German, <laughs> German autobahn thing then. Now it's on Ford to show us what they are capable of as for electric vehicles. This is the all new Ford Mustang Mach-E. Sporty Mustang jeans, exterior styling crossover, interior completely new, driving experience, of course, electric, here on Autogefühl, in full HD, full screen and full length. Let's go! In the front, you can see the Mustang jeans, so the sporty styling with the 
close grill in this case because it's an EV but strong accentuations on the hood. Rapid red is the color for the day but we also have other colors for you soon more to that. Then the contrasting lower area here closed in the lower part here too and headlamps standard with adaptive LED and you can see a very interesting daytime running light signature. The length is at 4 meters 71, 15 foot 5 or 185 inches and wheels come from 18 to 20 inch. These here are the 19 inch wheels in between maybe good compromise. Crossover styling here with the black piano lacquer and the red color for today and here the falling roof line sporty strong shoulders right there but indeed a crossover styling so not SUV but also nothing too low sitting again something in between why not then the base model start with rear wheel drive only already sporty touch of course and then you can also get an all-wheel drive model that means one electric motor in the rear one electric motor in the front that's also what we have here and you can get two different battery sizes either 68 kilowatt hours net or 88 kilowatt hours net so that's the real usable size and you can also combine them in whatever way possible so you can go rear wheel drive small battery rear wheel drive big battery or all wheel drive small battery and all wheel drive big battery so all is possible which one would you go for of course also always a matter of pricing the range of the big battery, by the way, in good conditions, 450 kilometers plus or 300 miles plus. The smaller battery then with a little bit of less range. And then it depends on do you flow it out on the motorway and what's the temperature outside, of course. Here the rear design with this you know, claw design, vertical, like we know from the old Mustangs as well, really spectacular. And then you can see here this lip that is forming and contrasting black in the lower area. AWD logo then here for the dual motor setup. The top speed by the way is 180 kilometers an hour or 112 miles per hour. Only if you have the GT model then you have 200 kilometers per hour or 125 miles per hour. Yeah and talking about GT model and acceleration figures and so on the normal rear wheel drive model starts around seven seconds in the acceleration figure. The all wheel drive model around six seconds in the acceleration figure. Just the GT model then less than four seconds, of course, than the quickest one. Recharging here at the driver's side only AC 11 kilowatts, DC 115 kilowatt for the small battery or 150 kilowatt for the big battery. That's already, you know, enough for 100 kilometers of recharging in 10 minutes approximately or 60 miles in 10 minutes. However, nowadays we also seen EVs with like 250 kilowatt peak charging or something. So they could still top it up a little bit, but already I think you can get along. And we also caught some other colors on camera. Here the carbonized gray, then the little bit brighter iconic silver, and even brighter the so-called space white, or then more in the blue tone, a dark infinite blue metallic. Khaki. It's quite bulky actual, doesn't feel that premium alike. And to open the vehicle, you have several options. You can use the standard khaki. You can also use your smartphone, that's possible. And you also have this area here with the key code, for example, for rental cars or something. So, different options they offer in this respect. Then you, you know, can hold on right there and open it here. There we go. And then inside of the doors, this car is completely animal free. So an animal friendly and sustainable approach. Soft touch here, both inside of the doors right here and there. This is here to release the door. <laughs> Interesting solution, definitely. Then you have an optional B&O sound system, 10 speaker here with a fabric cover. That's really cool. The speaker is underneath that. Mustang entry 
badge right there, red contrast stitches, steering wheel also with red contrast stitches, left side to control the cruise control, right side for example the volume, then also nice fabric inserts right here with a very shallow digital instrument cluster, but actually clear to read and you see here 450 kilometers is the projected range, so yeah, something 300 miles, 450 kilometers is indeed a realistic range here for the big battery all-way drive model. Then the seats. You have two seatings available, either, you know, the whole slick surface, or then here, the optional, it's like a premium package, optional with perforation, that's more breathable then, and both are Again, animal free and high grade leatherette, so it really feels super premium, very soft. You get the same tactile feeling you would get with the animal based one, just that it's, you know, using less resources and sparing the animals. So, really cool choice. And the GT model will get microfiber on the inside surface and also microfiber applications on the steering wheel, and also the steering wheel. Again, animal free, so it's the first time we see that in the Ford, and of course, a huge step forward. Great. So, then seating is electric here also, and the seating position is indeed crossover alike. It doesn't feel like a high SUV, but it doesn't feel like a sedan, indeed, something in between. And again, the cool thing I immediately realize is that the seats are really very soft and plush, and usually, when you have non-fabric surfaces, so like, you know, rather slick surfaces, they sometimes tend to, you know, feel a little bit hard or harsh, but here really soft and nice, so happy with that. Steering wheel can be controlled right here, up and down, in and out, doesn't feel most premium this, uh, you know, in this area. We see mixed things here indeed, so um, some things we look at or feel or touch are somewhat mediocre, like the buttons at the steering wheel, like the system here for controlling the steering wheel column, but then again the fabric surfaces here, or the seats, these are really high grade, high class, so indeed, you know, mixed as for the build quality so far. But definitely a huge step forward if you co compare like standard common Ford models, this is indeed something completely different here. Headroom with 1m86 or 6 with one still something left. And here, this is the panoramic roof. It is a fixed one, you cannot open it. What's interesting is that for the front windscreen and also for this panoramic roof, you have a special UV coating available. And this is then reducing, you know, the, the impact of sun rays coming from the outside. So when you get this panoramic roof, you can also be sure that not too much heat gets on the interior. Interior overview, once again, really cool with the fabric inserts here and the B&O sound system. Then this is more carbon fiber style, so to speak. Contrast stitches and then this vertical huge screen, 15.5 inch. So really massive, soon more details to all of that. You can already see there's a great screen clarity while the colors and the you know sharpness is really awesome. This is really cool, but the user interface, Soon more to that. Left side, 10.2 inch. This, you know, shallow but wide display then for speed and for the range and so on. And the steering wheel, once again, from this perspective with the Mustang logo. Um, yeah, but then, you know, the buttons and so are somewhat usual standard. Other things then look really premium in this vehicle. In the lower part, you have a really lot of space. That's really cool. Also with an inductive charging pad. You can also connect Apple CarPlay or Android Auto with, you know, just wirelessly. But you can also use the cable, USB-C and USB-A, so both is available. Good solution. Then adaptive cup holders, it's also nice. And also the middle console here is very well executed. Here with the turning, you know, shifting lever here for the D mode. And uh, then we have here this armrest, well attached it up and then this is also a good build quality with a lot of space and 12 volt power supply so overall really liking what i see so far the instruments here with an easy layout the digital speed then gps information so it's actually simple but straightforward once again and the range of around about 450 kilometers or 280 miles is really good because you know this projection here at minus one degrees celsius so that's freezing point and you know, when it's cold, the batteries usually have 
lower range or the vehicles have lower range so it's already a good figure for this temperature. It's really hard to catch this here on a normal 16 to 9 camera unless you have vertical video syndrome. <laughs> yeah, about that. So uh, put it in a YouTube search, vertical video syndrome and watch that video. I really recommend it. So and then here the GPS map, really responsive and again really clear display. I really like that. Then you have some, um, you know, like an app view here in the lower area and this is the only physical thing like attached on the screen for the volume and I think that's really good because in some you know situations you just want to turn up and down the volume manually so to speak and I think that's really cool to have that still climate uh, control right here not physical but still at least somewhat easily accessible so that works and Seat, uh, seat heating and steam reheating is in the lower area. This is maybe a little bit complicated to control than here in this lower area. Yeah, but this Ford Sync 4 system here, completely new generation and nothing like we've seen ever before with the Fords. So uh, really cool. Then this part here is, yeah, doesn't have the best overview. So yeah, the user interface could be maybe a little bit less complicated, but overall I think I'm happy with that. Here the vehicle controls with the driving modes. This you know rather changes like the throttle input, for example, untamed then referring to untamed horses, mustangs. Then you have even more throttle input, for example. And then here you can activate or deactivate the one pedal driving from works. It leaves without it, but usually when you're used to electric vehicle driving you activate it because in the moment you get off the throttle the car is already decelerating usually that's a safety thing so it's better than from transition to the brakes and when you have the one pedal driving you basically in most situations do not need the brakes anymore so i would recommend to leave it on camera also with a crisp resolution that looked creepy with the guy right there <laughs> are we in some horror movie hmm. interesting so, not sure why it's <laughs> interesting. Hmm, that look doesn't look too live-ish, but the resolution itself is really cool. But that's great. <laughs> okay. Hmm. It's a glitch. It's a glitch. Yeah, it's a glitch in the matrix. We found a glitch in the matrix. Told you. Let me tell you why you're here. So, and here we also have the surround view from from above. Overall. Really interesting to... <laughs> it's another glitch with a vehicle. <laughs> yeah. Life and auto fuel. I know you like it that way. Drive assistance systems. They can also, for example, change limit available mode is also available. So overall, impressive system. Not too much overloaded. I think we can very well control it and have a lot of fun with it. And again, it's very responsive. And now, let's see. There you can already see me in the 360 degree view. At the moment the front camera is mounted because I'm in the normal G mode. So was it just a glitch? Or have I repaired the matrix? Hello? I think now it's smooth again, right? So yeah, obviously I'm fitting to the matrix. Well, you have an all electric new car, all electric sound, but... Do -do -do, do -do -do. You still have the classic Ford, hey! You open the door sound and still have the ignition on. <laughs> Just read the comment, Thomas, you forgot the door closing sound. Thanks for the heads up, of course, we'll do that. Front. That doesn't sound that good. Mm, rather a little bit weird. But now I got a surprise for you. The door closing sound in the rear. Sounds awesome. So, <laughs> yeah, that's rare in the front, not that good, but in the rear, very cool. Interesting. Then. The rear, right there, electric platform, that means no middle tunnel. Battery is placed in the lower part of the vehicle, of course, underneath the bottom to keep the center of gravity low. And also these leatherette seats here in the rear. By the way, they also have a brand name for it. They call it Sensico in Europe or Active X or Active X in the US. That's the brand name for the high-grade leatherette. And in the US, by the way, you also can get a beige color for that. That's also pretty amazing. Then inside of the doors in the rear is still here somewhat soft. Also again the leatherette use so really good build quality and once again I really love the fabric covers here for the B&O speakers. Really cool. The seat as I would be driving means 
You can easily house four tall adults in this vehicle. Maybe five, we'll soon find out. Here, still some legroom left. You sit relatively high, so it will be quite cool for kids as well. Since we have this fixed panoramic roof, there's also still space above my head. To the side, still somewhat okay. And yeah, good view. I, Michelle always likes to film that one. So this uh, panoramic roof, you see the, you know, the, the tinting of the windows, the UV protection, but then great view to the outside. Here, by the way, these hangers are interesting. They're like hidden here, and then you can fold them out, putting a jacket or something. It's quite interesting. Isofix at the outsides each. You can already fold the seats from here. This is like the classic folding mechanism button in the middle part here. Let's see, no middle tunnel, therefore it's easy. And since this leatherette is, so, again, I have to say, super high quality, extremely soft, you can take a look at that here again. When I put my fingers on it, then you can see, like visually see how soft it is. So very well done. And also the middle seat can be occupied quite well, headroom and legroom wise, just a little bit harder than at the back, but you can also, again, drive it with five tall adults done. Here you can have adaptive cup holders. That's interesting. And in the middle console here, once again, this split between USB-C and USB-A, and I think it's a good solution because there's so many devices out there. Some still have the USB-A, some still have the, or already have the USB-C. I think it's a good mix then in this case. So I'm really happy overall with the interior, what I see so far. And now to the trunk or the boot. Here with a swiping of foot gesture, you can also open this electric hatch. 29 up to 60 cubic feet or 400 liters up to 1,400 liters. If we fold the seats. Square dimensions, very well usable. Then you can fold this one here up and have, for example, space for your charging cables. You can put it here in the rear, but also in the front, of course. And that not too high the sill. Then you can also reach over here and then fold seats like this. And then you really have a lot of space, so very well usable. It's not too high here though, but you can see you can fit the backpack in here. Just not like, you know, like here, but push it a little bit more inward. The only disadvantage is when you have these really high things in the trunk and they hit it from below while closing, this can here pop out of the anchor. So, um, yeah, and then you have it like hanging around, you have to put it in place again. That's the only disadvantage of it. But overall, still very reusable, child safety test. Yeah, very sensitive, so no problem as for that. And now let's leave the backpack right there. You see here, it touches then this top part. Not sure if it will do any problem this time. Let's reopen it. There's the button below. I think this time, yeah, this time it worked. I'm not sure, maybe like, the backpack was standing here last time. Did it cause any problems right there? See here we, when it goes down to the backpack now. Yeah, I think I think now it happened. Let's see. Let's open again. Yeah, the, it, it worked. But you see, yeah, it hit like here, and then it can happen that they, that they, there it is that it pushes it from below, and then this happens. Yeah, but of course you can also at any time completely remove it if you want. And we have a frunk, five cubic feet or 80 liters. And you can have this split here in the front. That's of course a little bit plastic ishy, but yeah, I probably would not go with that, but just have an open area for the charging cable and so on. And what's interesting is it's also a so-called Ford Megabox. We know it from the Ford Puma. There is a drain even, so you can put some ice cubes in it and the water could rinse through theoretically. And interesting feature here, design feature, Mustang stamping here from the inside. Before we get to the normal driving lounge, let's start with the acceleration. We have an open air field just for us for the acceleration test. Why Mach E or Mach as we say in German for the pronunciation. Mach 1 is the speed of sound for airplanes, that's 760 miles per hour or 1230 kilometers per hour. Well, the car doesn't reach that, but it says here ground speed, also airplane inspired and Mach E, of course, and the electric, you know, airplane, and yeah, you get it. So let's do the acceleration here in the untamed mode. And 
and top speed, 180. Woo! Yeah, that went quite quick. So, nice acceleration. All-wheel drive model here of the Ford Mustang E. Ford Mustang Mach E. <laughs> yeah, we talked about that. And we directly have a slalom mode here for us. Steering is redirect, but doesn't convey such a good feeling. But the suspension is actually quite sporty. So it is fun to steer it around. Missing a little bit of the steering feeling is a little bit, you know, not connected to the road, but definitely a lot of driving fun and super direct the vehicle and the throttle response, electric motor, direct torque. There. And it's all, all, <laughs> when you have passengers and it's like <laughs> so you really have to <laughs> take care of your passengers but yeah really quick acceleration the GT model will be even faster but here this one is the fastest non-GT model so to speak and now welcome to the usual Thomas Thomas's driving lounge here, electric driving lounge with the Ford Mustang Mach E. And we start on the German motorway right here. What about the noise insulation? We are yeah, inching towards 120 kilometers an hour, so yeah, something 70 miles per hour. And noise insulation is not that bad, but also not superb. We've had other EV competitors that are a little bit better as for noise insulation. Here it's comparable to the noise level of the Teslas we've driven, I would say. Whereas, for example, the, you know, the Audi or the Porsche EVs were a little bit more silent, also more optimized for higher speeds. Overall, um, here on the motorway, you know, from first test seating and the looks more crossover-like, here I really have to say now, it already tells you a little bit more SUV. You have this upright seating position, you have a good overview of the road and so on. So indeed, I more and more get rather SUV than the crossover feeling. The steering could have a little bit more feeling for my taste. So it is very direct and sporty, but it doesn't convey the best connection from like driver, car and the road. Um, as for the energy economy so again it really depends on the outside temperature and how much you floor it down and so on um, but here on our trip so far when we are at reasonable motorway speeds we are in a higher 20 kilowatt hours in one kilometer regions so that's done at the moment here like 25 kilowatt hours one kilometer something like that that's then something like 35 kilowatt hours on 100 miles this would rather come close than to a 400 kilometers of range or 250 miles of range but, you know it, but it really really depends but overall i think it's quite okay so far what we see in this respect a lot of assistance systems packed in this vehicle as well we have a blind spot monitor for example also in the side mirrors hope to be able to showcase to you showcase this to you very soon the suspension we have here is normal steel suspension but so far it does a good job it's a good compromise between sportiness and comfort. Only the GT model will get an adaptive suspension, so-called magnet ride or magni ride, which then adapts to the, you know, to, to the surface a little bit more and also to the driving modes you pick. Really cool you've seen with the new multimedia system, Ford Sync 4, 4A. The GPS is running here, the car GPS, although I have the Apple CarPlay or Android Auto mounted and that was so far not the case. So far in the Ford Sync systems you could not use both, but now it's possible to use the car internal GPS even though when we have the CarPlay mounted that's of course a big step forward. And also over the air updates are possible now, so called OTAs, then you can also keep your system updated. Here now, German motorway, unlimited speed here, and we are at 100 kilometers an hour, and we can accelerate it out. Let's go. Well, that's 150 kilometers an hour. Really quick also in the acceleration, even though we were already at speed. 
changing the driving modes while driving. Here you press this vehicle button, a little bit distracting to do that while driving, definitely. But here and then the driving modes, active, whisper, untamed. Let's go to the untamed mode and see if there's any difference. Also sound-wise there's a little difference. So I'll drop back to, there's the blind monitor. See the symbol in the side mirrors. Now I drop back to 100 kilometers, 60 miles an hour. And as soon as we can have a safe acceleration again, I will... Uh, okay, warm up here. Blind side monitor also blinking when I hit the turning indicator. Yeah, after this motorbike and this tuned GTI. So get ready, now in the untamed mode. And 150. So the throttle input was a little bit quicker then and you also heard this electric sound, you know, this sound generator then in the untamed mode you get this sound feedback. And so, yeah, I mean, why not? So, yeah, if you like it or not, it, it really depends on just personal preference. I'm in the one pedal driving mode. So when I go off the throttle, we have immediately a strong deceleration. Usually I do not need the brakes at all than the normal brakes. And you can have different steps. You can, when you deactivate this mode and you lift the throttle, you just, you know, you just roll, especially in the, in the normal driving modes. That way, car is rolling. Then you have here this L mode, like a low gear, you know from combustion engines. Then there's stronger recuperation. And even stronger then in the one pedal mode. And then when you're in the one pedal driving mode, then the L setting also, you know, you can just ignore it basically. And you're just fine with the normal D mode. So again, I would recommend rather user using it in the one pedal driving feeling mode. Uh, that's how you drive EV nowadays. There are different philosophies of that on the market, definitely. Um, especially the German manufacturers rather go on rolling mode, for example. But BMW has a, th a good approach to that, I think, because they have rather this rolling approach, but then they have this intelligent assistant where you lift the throttle, and then when the car is in front of you, there's recuperation happening. So this, I think, could be a good compromise of that. Other than that, you can argue for and against it if you know which way is actually the better one um, yeah would be looking forward to your feedback so far feeling quite safe here also at 150 kilometers an hour high speed also here when i do the lane change the car is really stable the suspension again is a good compromise of sportiness and comfort so you'll be fine with the base suspension um, yeah just that steering is a little bit too artificial for me let's test it once again this was the active mode now i'm back in this untamed mode what about the steering wheel, steering feeling? It doesn't change too much for me now. Yeah, so that's to me the biggest let off of the vehicle. Again, it feels sporty, but more arcade style. It's not that it delivers a natural driving feeling. However, it does deliver you sporty Mustang fun. You have a great acceleration. No doubt about that. You whoa. They almost collided. That happened. Yeah. Also, very interesting things you can always see on the road when we are in our driving parts. Yeah, no. Let's go back to the normal driving mode right here. Deceleration when I get off the throttle. Pretty st strong deceleration indeed. That you can also compare to, to Tesla, definitely. Um, you know, what about the, you know, the, the energy consumption when you are at high speeds? So usually we have, you know, when we really go like full speed, really hit the throttle, then you're usually putting it to double the, you know, double the output. That is like the, the normal thing that is happening, you know. And yeah, controlling the screen you are driving, again, sometimes a little bit distracting. Here now, Actually, I'm quite surprised that although we had high speed, we were relatively efficient. Now we're at 23 kilowatt hours and one kilometers. So that's done like 30 something kilowatt hours and 100 miles. This brings us back to our projected range of 450 kilometers or 280 miles. 
and considering we are driving quite fast, I think that's that's really, yeah, that's really quite good. So happy with that so far. Um, when we, for example, we set the trip another trip meter here, and I set the set the cruise control, for example, then keeping assist on now, and I set the cruise control. Let's see how much we can score then when we are in a, in a very reasonable level. So here, cruise control is set. Now also the lane keeping assist, let's test that. Here the car is being actively kept in the lane. Of course, always keep your hands on the steering wheel. But so far, it's doing a quite good job and it's not that nervous and small corrections of that, feeling quite safe. Yeah, well done so far. And let's see if at any point I also get the warning, keep hands in the steering or something. Because sometimes there are these false positives when you are going straight, 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 long motorway rides. And some cars, you know, they don't realize you're still on them. And then they are, you know, staying like a moved steering wheel or something. But here so far, so good. And really calm also on the motorway as for the assistance systems. So a good safety system pack we have here. Do you still feel you would be driving a Ford? I mean, yes, somewhat due to the interior, but again, this is something completely new, a huge step forward for the whole brand, no doubt about that. If you wondered, by the way, about the all-wheel drive distribution, you know there is a rear-wheel only model and there's then this all-wheel drive model. If you have the all-wheel drive model like we have here with the two electric motors, you still have a rear wheel bias. So the predominant motor the car is using is the rear motor. And when you really accelerate it out, then also more power from the front electric motor is being demanded. And I think that's really good for the agility of the vehicle. And once again, setting cruise control here at the higher speeds. Now also in this slight corner, Active lane keeping assist is still doing a good job. And also set the distance I want to have to the car in front of us. For example, minimum distance or here, car is decelerating immediately when I set a longer distance. Really happy also with the assistance system so far. So driving wise, once again, I think, now keep your hands on the steering wheel. And now it's you know, demanding that I shake it a little bit, but this was the first time that happened. And I can, for example, oh, there's a speed camera. Hmm. Good that we didn't catch that. I already have my photo right here, you know, like on my video. I don't need the, don't need the separate one. <laughs> yeah, I mean, when a car goes that quick, you always have to watch out. No doubt about that. Switching between the GPS and other uh, things, you see here, click in this kind of app thing. Um, right, no, straight and then right, right, yeah. Exactly, you have the big map here, left side then some, you know, minor errors uh, that you, not errors, but arrows that you see here on the digital screen. So that's also a nice combination and since it's also put quite high, you do not miss necessarily a head-up display. So actually I'm also fine with that. Now off the motorway, suspension-wise, we're really happy also too. So when you ask me, sporty Mustang jeans, definitely yes. Mm, there are more silent vehicles on the motorway at higher speeds, yes, but it's also quite reasonable as for noise insulation. Good suspension, as we know from Ford. Even better probably will be the GT suspension than when you have the adaptive suspension there. Nice performance. The user interface is yeah, here and there could be a little bit better, but still quite good to use and definitely a huge step forward as for that. Interesting also from the whole electric technology, fast charging could maybe be a little, a little bit faster. What was that? Interesting. Was it like wiper fluid or something? Hmm, very strange. 
about that. So, and um, you know, the only thing here with the steering wheel. So driving-wise, that the steering wheel does not have like the you know the best feeling in it. That's something they could improve. Other than that, really nice flawless driving experience here on the motorway so far. And some more calmer driving, lower speeds. And I really have to say, yeah, it has this sports heritage and so on. But to me, this is more also a cruiser. Yes, it has some performance acceleration, no doubt. But it's really cool and suitable for, you know, also for some rural roads or also for some city driving because it's not a small vehicle, but it doesn't feel too big because it's quite agile. But as a cruiser for some nice and fun roads, I think that's 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 where it's, where it's at home, you know, because it's not the sportiest EV. It's also not, you know, the EV that is most on comfort. However, due to the very soft and plush seating surface, upright seating position, and the good suspension, to me, it's really very comfortable. That's what you know, what I find really really cool. And I mean, direct compares, of course, the Tesla Model Y. And for example, also the VW ID4. Yeah, they were still having a lot of software issues. That's better definitely with this one here today. And we also have, for example, some nice energy meters. And for example, showing me like percentage of climate use, root accessories, and the exterior temperature. So, what are the crucial factors here for my energy consumption? And here at the moment, it's 84% the root. That means like, you know, how are we going up, down, putting all the foot on the accelerator and so on. This varies, of course, then depending on the outside temperature and how you really drive. But definitely interesting to see, especially for the passengers, because they can concentrate a little bit more on all these details, not necessarily that you have it as a driver. That's why they made the instruments also really restricted or you know limited in the you know, in, in what you can actually see and I think that's also a good decision so rather keep it simple so I think also when you think about the pricing yeah you know starting then below 50,000 euros or dollars and when you put it full spec like it is here now you still stay below 70,000 euros or dollars which is not cheap at all, no, but if you consider the competition, BMW iX3 would also be a competitor, definitely. Um, yeah, I mean, especially the US prices are always a little bit fairer since this car is also built in Mexico, and then it's also a little bit more expensive for us when we buy it in Europe. Yeah, so if you ask me now, um, from the EV SUVs I have driven, I mean, Tesla Model X is more expensive and bigger, but still taking that one into account, BMW iX3, BMW ID4, um, the Audi e-tron, and uh, Mercedes EQC, all somewhat in different price regions and um, in different segments. More and more are coming up definitely, and we are keep you we are, we are keeping you updated as for that definitely here also on our channel. Um, but this one to me is you know in this middle segment around these competitors you know it's cheaper than some of the super expensive premium competitors it already offers you really interesting luxury features like for example is the, the you know the new seating material and an extensive infotainment unit and so on for you know like tech oriented people mm, yeah some of the build quality here and there is totally fine but not on a level like on a really high premium car uh, yeah, so I would say it's it's a good choice then in between. If you don't want to go too expensive, still what something spicy, you know. As for the sporty touch here with the Mustang logo and the name, and this the sporty styling and so on. So um, yeah, I mean, why not? This is Thomas with Auto Gefühl today for you with the Skoda Enyaq Sportline 
all-wheel drive, the ATX version, so a powerful version with all-wheel drive and the sporty style on the exterior. And we can see here a big spoiler and we have the magic black color for today, which is a good match to the sport line. A high trim level comes automatically with the matrix LED lamp stem, otherwise they are an option and interesting daytime running light. And when you have the main headlamp unit activated, you also can get the light strip in the front grille here when you have this optional crystalline illuminate front grille, a very spectacular option here for the Skoda Enyaq. It's a system model to the VW ID4 and soon also one to the ID5 because the Skoda Enyaq can also be bought soon as the Enyaq Coupe. We have a preview here with the camouflage color for you. Here then in the side profile, 183 inches or 4 meters 65 is the length. So let's say a mid-size SUV but all electric here and you can get it with rear drive or all-wheel drive. This one here today is the more powerful all-wheel drive, uh, all drive version ATX. So we come at the acceleration figure of about 6.9 seconds. Faster will only be the VRS version, which is then again half a second faster, but it will be based on the same technology. Wheels from 18 to 21 inch. These here are indeed the biggest one, 21 inch. The Sport line here comes with 20 inch, but these one are even optional. And then you can see also this two-tone scheme, Sport line batching here and a stronger side spoiler right there. This one once again in the rather, you know, SUV form, rather form for those function. So a rather simple and likable design here in the side profile. The 80 version would be the one with the big battery, however, then we will drive only. And this one here, 80. X is the one, big battery, 77 kilowatt hours, and then also with the all-wheel drive, 265 horsepower and a top speed of only, you can say, 160 kilometers an hour or 100 miles per hour. Some EVs in that respect go a little bit further. They rather, you know, look at the range then. Yeah, and then we can calculate something, 400 kilometers, 250 miles. We'll see later in the driving part if this is then really true because we have uh, you know, earlier experiences here with the rear drive version. Then in the lower part, you can see here rather simple design once again, all in black today with you know, also all the batchings and so on. So that sport line here together with the all drive version, definitely a dream setup for the Skoda Enyaq. Hey, and I also found a Thomas blue one. Skoda calls it race blue. This would definitely be my favorite color for today. But of course, the black one also looks very nice in the sport line. And now the outlook fuel turning indicator check or the headlight lights. Wait a minute, the indicator check, 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 you know, check, check Republic, where the brand comes from. Too obvious? <laughs> well, here in the cascading style, I think it'd be a very beautiful style, right? Hey, and in the front, it also looks quite amazing, right? Replacing the daytime running light right there. And yeah, probably from this day on, we will check everything out <laughs> with Skoda reviews. And now let's check out the interior. Okay, last time for the day. <laughs> yeah, that's the car key. Yeah, high gloss black. Not my favorite indeed. Door closing sound. That's very solid, like that. And then inside of the doors, this one here has soft touch. It's actually quite good. Nice structure. Then this carbon fiber style. It's not real carbon fiber. Then here is soft leatherette. This um, grab handle is a little bit strange and also put a little bit more, you know, I'm not sure if it's really so good to handle indeed. Oh, this small garbage can. Yeah, these are the Skoda simply clever details like trash. <laughs> and then this is the Sportline interior. Very interesting. You have this perforated steering wheel and the Sportline badge. This only comes with animal skin, which is not that logical for the EVs. And well, about the seats, they're actually quite cool because they're a mix of, you know, fabric and microfiber or this microfiber style here on the side perforated. Um, and some of the inserts are leatherette and some others are animal skin, which again doesn't make any sense. You can go for a base version of the Enyaq to go animal free with the seats completely, but then this one would be the, let's say, second best pick. So if you pick high trim, these are actually then still the best choice. Um, and they are indeed very comfortable from the seat form, you know. they hold you tighter a little bit, you don't slide in them, but they're extremely comfortable, so very good also long term. Then steering wheel, up and down, in and out, easy function. So first side here, very likable interior. The only thing, look at that here, the instruments, they are extremely small. At least they're not you know, tied onto the steering wheel like in the ID4. 
However, they say, yeah, small instruments are enough because most of the time you will be using the head-up display if you got that option. Yeah, you can follow this argument, but fancy instruments like in the Audi Q4 e-tron are also quite nice, right? Headroom, one with a six or six with one, enough left. This one is also one with the panoramic roof. And the interesting thing is that this one here can indeed be opened. So some of the, or most of the electric vehicles nowadays have these fixed panoramic roofs. The coupe version of the Enec would also come with a fixed panoramic roof, which you cannot open. And um, yeah, but here you can leave a lot of light and also rain in. I hope it doesn't come down today. Interesting that, by the way, here, this small cubby hole next to the steering wheel on the left side, here, it can be opened with a separate button. I've never seen that. Usually they have like, you know, the opener right here integrated, but somehow funny. It's really small. Your Colt doesn't fit in there. <laughs> Just the key, for example. Here, the interior overview is actually quite sensual. More reminds us of a Mercedes or something here with these swinging lines, soft touch leather red. And the, again, these inserts, so it looks really beautiful, better than in the ID4, for example. Screens either 10 inch or this optional 13 inch screen. You have a volume slider here, which is again, yeah, these sliders are hashtag capacitive curse. The temperature are not in sliders like in the ID4, but here you always keep it at the same place. It's for a touch solution, relatively easy to control, but still no manual volume knobs for that. Zoom or deal to that screen there. In the lower part, you still have some hard keys still as hotkeys, like the climate. Um, then you can access it in the screen once again. In the lower part, you have two spots to put the smartphone, but just one for the inductive charging. So not like in the Tesla Model Y, where we have two inductive charging spots. Then here, cup holders can be kind of adapted. And this is a very short shifting lever like this. So that's actually easy solution. More cubby space right here. and. Very well attached armrest and this car again yeah as we know from Skoda they have really really a lot of space here this little bit plastic ish here however but the general build quality is actually quite high here at the steering wheel better for the volume knob is like here you know use it just here or the heated steering wheel and then you can you know control something in digital instruments but not much actually once again it rather has a head-up display focus and a display with some GPS information and you can also have the augmented reality function and you have kind of like moving arrows in it. And interesting functions also when there's snow, there's a snow mode and then the letters are blue. Actually, that's the difference here. So when everything is white, then you can still read your head-up display. In the infotainment system, you have this main menu here and you can very well access it actually, like the distance, you know, where you have to put your hand. And you can also configure your own home screen right here. Let's check out the map, which is, yeah, from the visualization wise, looks a little bit old school. It's also not that responsive. It's okay. Meanwhile, these vehicles here from the Volkswagen Group have received software updates. And so they're more reliable and faster, but that doesn't make it super suitable. Let's take it that way. Seat heating can be accessed right here. No you know, rather quick way. And here in this main menu, we can also access the Apple CarPlay, for example. Let's listen to the music here. Oh, that's a great song. Yeah. Yeah, it's actually quite decent here, that song. We don't have the top sound system, but this one is already quite nice, actually. So, and then we have also this vehicle setup here. Nice visualization there, too. And here we can, for example, also access things like here. When we go to interior, go to the head-up display, and then here we can change this um, this so-called snow mode for the head-up display. Yeah, yeah, really interesting thing, right? And here there's even more space underneath, so <laughs> for whatever you want to put there. Good usage here of the EV platform means there's here yeah, an even floor, and you also have a lot of leg rooms, no problem here. And also headroom-wise, no problem either. So for actually five tall adults, it's no problem at all. In the lower part, you, have, by the way, have two USB-C chars and a real power socket. That's also good. So a very practical car can even be, like, let's say, some kind of office vehicle. So here then you have some cup holders. Oh, and a pen holder. <laughs> well, a Skoda pen. So let's see here, the middle part. Yeah, even this part is fairly comfortable, a little bit less space than, of course, with your head. And, it's, you know, it has this sport seat single setup here in the rear. So, 
once again, is a very, very comfortable vehicle on all seats. Will it frunk or not? <laughs> so, da -da. no frunk, just some feelings for the wiper fluid. Recharging, 11 kilowatt AC or 125 kilowatt DC, but only here for the bigger 77 kilowatt hour battery. A smaller battery also doesn't charge that quickly. And by the way, Michelle just told me that this would be a very satisfi satisfying sound. You know, like when you close it. So, you guys like that sound? <laughs> Now the trunk, 585 up to 1,710 liters, but what does that mean? First of all, this cover here with a nice rail at the side. And then here the length of the trunk is about 90 centimeters or 36 inches. And the width is a good meter or 40 inches. The height here to the cover, about 50 centimeters, that's substantial, or 20 inches. And you can see here the backpack easily fits in and also the cabin trolley. You can fold the seats very easily right from here already, like this and like this, and then also the whole thing folds. Actually, there is this kind of step in there. That's not the most practical thing, however, when you just want to push things through and here underneath the cover you can have a storage for the charging cables overall very spacious very well usable and the length of the trunk when we fold the seats 175 centimeters or 69 inches yeah i know you like that Plop. that is zero to 60 not wasn't more Right, zero to 60, or a little more <laughs> kilometers an hour. Nice acceleration in that sport mode from the all-wheel drive. So really quick, at the same time, very smooth, both front and rear power. And since this is a rear-wheel driven platform, basically, or the base models have rear-wheel drive, this one still has a little bit more punch than from the rear. Very interesting and super cool, super sporty, although, it's essentially already a big SUV, you know, and especially on the interior, you have so much space. At the same time, you can drive it in a very sporty way. With these 21 inch wheels here, even option Sportline, 20 inch would be the better choice. Um, you know, however, considering it's 21 inch, it's still a decent comfort indeed. You have these different driving modes, by the way, and then there's also this individual mode, and there you can really individually tune the DCC, so this car is with the adaptive suspension, dynamic chassis control, and here you can really fine-tune it. Before it was sometimes only possible to you know have these certain presets, and now you can really fine-tune it to your liking and then save this individual mode as for that. That is very interesting. But yeah, most of the time you also have the mode selector here in the lower part, and then you can um, but you know that's actually not that good. So you can not switch it through like when I click mode button that it doesn't click mode 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 i have to press it and then choose it here in the infotainment system that's not the best solution definitely here in a normal or comfort mode then the suspension is tuned a little bit softer that gives us even more comfort that's really a good thing so suspension is good and the center of gravity is low and centered due to the battery pack and that means although it's already a big and heavy vehicle it has good driving agility the steering, super precise indeed, no dead zone area, very progressive from that input, so you don't have to steer a lot, you can keep your hands at the steering wheel all the time. So indeed, the first thing you really feel, the hardware of this vehicle is excellent. The whole chassis, the driving dynamics, how steering and everything is tuned, really great. There are a lot of vehicles that have different kinds of philosophies, Oh, now um, augmented reality head-up display. I see it um, as well in my line of sight, showing me like you know, like a blue arrow now to the right side. It's a good, good thing as well. So about the philosophy, um, you know, with um, with recuperation, sometimes it's harsh recuperation, like Tesla does, or like recently we had with the Volvo C40, and they say like, okay, that's it. We do it that way. Use the one-pedal driving and be happy with it. And you can argue pro and con against it. So a pro feature is always you take your foot off the throttle and then the car is already decelerating. That might be a safety thing. Then again, the co contra is when you have passengers here and you go off the throttle in an uncontrolled way, it's always like G-forces and it can be really you know, annoying for the passengers. Here, you can adjust it 
in different ways actually. So you can have the D mode, normal driving mode. When you get off the throttle there, you basically roll, even if it's uphill. Then there's the B mode, is the main recuperation mode then, and then it stays also that way, and you get off the throttle and have some recuperation, but it's not super strong. It is notably, but not super strong. And then the other thing is you can also use this shifting pedals on the steering wheel, and here have recuperation level one, two, three. And by the way, we often get the question like, what about the braking lights or something? Oh, there's some BMX driver, did some nice jumping. You guys want to do another one for the camera? No, oh, okay, not today, obviously. <laughs> so we have some entertainment here. So um, it depends really on you know how how strong the recuperation is. So there are some cars which have like slight recuperation here. For example, level one. Um, then it doesn't mean that the brake light is always on. You know, for example, we, we can we can check it from the outside as well. Um, but then in the stronger recuperation levels, like here level two or level three, or when you use the B mode, then definitely the brake light does always hop on in the rear because that's essentially the same way as braking is. You know, and that's of course a very important thing to do. So here you can really adjust it. Not sure if you will really do that. Um, I think it will probably be like IO driver that more enjoys, you know, that rolling effect and then use the recuperation while the brake pedal or go direct to this B mode there. And I meanwhile think that the compromise in between is the right one, the one that BMW is already offering in their electric vehicles with this adaptive recuperation. That means when the adaptive cruise control, for example, like the sensors see, oh, there's something in front of, yeah, that's really something in front of us, like a wall in front of us. <laughs> hey, that's a driving wall. <laughs> so uh, then, you know, speed's being reduced and when there's nothing in front of, in front of you, which the sensor is picking up or something, then the speed is not being reduced. I think that's actually a good solution. Here, as for the size of the ENIAC, it's still in a way that you can easily get along with. But yeah, the thing is here with the controls, mm, user interface, changing temperature while driving is somewhat okay, but not the best. The infotainment system is also somewhat okay, but again, not the best. Yeah, so user interface, not the best, but also not the worst. Beautiful uh, small town here, by the way, in the more or less Frankfurt area we're driving here with you today. So this car actually does so much things in one. You know, it has, has great driving agility. It's fine to drive it through narrow cities still. It has great comfort from the seats. The sports seats really upgrade the comfort overall. It has good acceleration, we've seen it um, initially, so very impressed by what we see and what we do here. Of course, what we also want to show to you is what about higher speed on the motorway and what about the average energy consumption. These are also very two crucial features. Here once again, countryside driving, nice view and so agile once again. And here in normal mode, it's leaning a little bit, but once again, you can go to the sport mode and be distracted while choosing that one. And then <laughs> you have a little bit more feedback from that suspension, goes a little bit stiffer, and it's really a pleasure here, both in the city and, and also in countryside situations. So one more time, putting to sport mode and getting on the motorway, German Autobahn. Woo! Really nice from the acceleration feature once again and very smooth also the handling of the whole vehicle and here also in this faster getting on the motorway corner. Look at that here, steering wheel turning, 90 degree turn or 180 then after all. Really nice out the corner. And now from 70 km an hour, let's go. It's 120. Now a little bit downhill, 150. And now we're getting to 160 kilometers an hour, so yeah, 163 actually, 164 downhill. Um, so yeah, around 100 miles an hour, that's the top speed and noise insulation is very good. And yeah, I mean, when you live in Germany and you tend to drive a little bit faster, then it's strange that I go to the left lane and the car is restricted and there's not more happening, you know. So that's indeed unusual to me, <laughs> but that might just be a German problem. By the way, the consumption here at top speed, so around, you know, when it was flat, 
around 40 kilowatt hours on 100 kilometers. So that would mean that top speed you could drive, let's say 180 kilometers an hour, something like this, or you could, yeah, some 100 miles per hour you could drive at top speed. The overall range, you know, when you drive normally, we had some average consumption figures of some like 19 kilowatt hours, 20 kilowatt hours, and one kilometers. That means indeed, as projected from me, as we had the experience last time, around 400 kilometers or 250 miles of realistic range. So rear drive model is of course a little bit more efficient, but it doesn't make the biggest difference if you go for the overdrive model. It will make a difference if you go for the bigger battery or the small battery. Now we have really uneven road and so on, but once again, although 21 inch wheels, super comfortable. So um, yeah, once again, getting back to my point that this car can do everything. It can do city driving. It can do, you know, it can house your whole family. You can drive it just by yourself in a very nice and also sporty way and definitely sportier than the combustion engine brother. So this is essentially also a Kodiak RS already, you know, from the driving dynamics. And also very comfortable long-term here, motorway journey. The only thing, if you're German and if you have, you see here now, the speed is already limited. Yeah, then you might think, yeah, I want to drive faster than 160 kilometers now, but again, the use case will of course be limited even in Germany. Overall, I think a very, very decent package they have here for us. Bit by bit, BMW is presenting their all-electric models besides the older BMW i range. Now, the existing cars are being electrified and they run just from the same assembly line as the combustion engine models. And here today, we have the BMW iX3 for you, the electrified BMW X3 in our driving part. But of course, a tour on exterior, interior, and then the electrified driving experience. As you know, in full HD, full screen and full length. Let's go. Sometimes it's strange as for the strategy of the automotive manufacturers. Volkswagen AG began with electrifying their existing vehicles, then now went on to a purely electric platform. BMW Group started with pure electric platforms, separate like BMW i3 and so on. And now they went the other way and just produced the very same vehicles like BMW X3 here with combustion engine, same platform, also then as the all electric version. Yeah, you can't really say what's wrong or what's right. It's more about the volume of cars, you know, the number of cars you build, what probably makes more sense. Hmm, we'll see who will succeed even more. The frontier of the BMW iX3, you can see almost closed front double kidney in this new electric style. Then blue is the color and yeah, for me, Thomas Blue favorite really cool, especially here with these accentuations and the inside of the kidney. We also have a dark blue color here for today. Headlamps standard with LED, optional the adaptive LED lights, they are also right here and then they also have a more sophisticated daytime running light. So overall it does not look too different from normal X3, more really, you know, with this closed front grille look, but I think, you know, it works. Or what's your take on it? The length is at 4 meters 73, 15 foot 5, or 186 inches, the same as the combustion engine BMW X3. They are different wheels, either 19 or 20 inch, and both in an aerodynamic style. You can see here, these are the optional 20 inch wheels. Then you have special I accentuations, like here, BMW i is still the electric brand, and a blue contrast here, bright blue contrast in the lower area. So this gives, you know, a little 
unique styling. Still the crossover wheel arches and then the classic building formula of the X3 with the upright windows that also gives you a good roundabout visibility. Very interesting painting by the way if you look closely and you can see almost like sparkling in the paint. Really interesting. Technology wise of course all electric means we have a big battery pack then in here and it's really in the lower center of the vehicle and this brings the center of gravity really way lower than with the normal vehicle, about 7.5 centimeters or 3 inches lower. And this then ensures a more sporty driving characteristic, although there's more weight. Soon more to that in the driving part, how will we experience that actually? This will be very exciting. But what do you think here about the styling of the EV version? This is the battery pack here. Yeah, it's a dummy sample. 80 kilowatt hours gross, 74 kilowatt hours net capacity, and this is supposed to give you an official range of 460 kilometers or 285 miles. And recharging here, AC and DC, really nice covers here for both, and also like you know, a soft pad behind that, so that's very well done. 11 kilowatt AC charging, 150 kilowatt DC fast charging is possible, and they also feature a heat pump here in the iX3 and they claim that this is you know, overall bringing 30% more efficiency if you compare it to the BMW i3. And what does the heat pump do? It doesn't you know, you know, put your range higher or something, but the thing is that it reduces the effect that the range get, gets reduced in winter times. So that's what the heat pump is actually doing. It is again increasing the efficiency that you have less range losses. And BMW also calculated the efficiency factors or percentages when you think about what energy you put in in the first place and what is actually translated into motion then. And for the iX3 it's about 93% and for the comparable combustion engine it's less than 40%. And that doesn't only count for the BMW X3 versus iX3 but also in general about electric vehicles versus combustion engines. The electric vehicles are just more efficient from translating the initial power then into the power you set into motion. Really interesting. Then here at the rear you can see design was three-dimensional tail lamps but that's also normal for this X3 generation. Special for the iX3 is you know you have these like diffuser style blue accentuations in the lower part of course no <laughs> exhaust and these were criticized a little bit um, I've seen in the comments initially but I think it's also quite cool. You have also blue ring about the B, uh, you know around the BMW logo. We can also see it in the front. And I think it just adds some more unique styling here to the iX3. By the way, 286 horsepower is the peak output. 6.8 seconds is the acceleration figure to one kilometers or 62 miles an hour. It's a little bit slower than the comparable BMW X3 30i, but still, you know definitely reasonably powered this vehicle and the top speed of course all electric is electric only 180 kilometers an hour or 110 miles per hour and rear wheel drive only so that stands also for a sporty bmw suv and last thing here for the numbers as for the rear it does have a towing capacity somewhat limited 750 kilograms or about 1650 pounds and here we also have a white vehicle for you where these blue contrasts are even more prominent but if you say now hmm wait a minute i just want to have my ix3 look the very same as an x3 besides of the close kitten and so on you can also depick the blue contrast and have it just in the frozen gray. This is, by the way, also standard if you pick a different color, for example, with the red color, because BMW said red and blue doesn't mix that well. So with the red vehicle, for example, you have these accentuations then in frozen gray. Or then, as I said, you can just depick it also here for the white or for the black vehicle if you want to have a more plain, not so special look. Because here, especially, for example, with the white vehicle, the blue accentuations are really strong also again in the rear. For me personally, I found it just very cool in styling because it's actually unique and also signalized that you drive something different than an X3 combustion engine. But maybe you think about it differently, so I would like to hear you in the comments if you would go or stick with these contrasts or if you would actually depict them and go for a more plain look. Here once again the blue ring here around the BMW logo. So I found the styling really very beautiful. To me the most beautiful X3, but what's your take? And here the frunk 
is no frunk, so there's no real storage space under the front hood. That would have been cool, for example, for charging cable or something. Um, they just decided to have it like as a full cover. Then, you know, yeah, whatever, nothing to show you here. Then inside, let's check out the door closing sound. That sounds quite good. Then here, sensor tech top parts, a soft touch. Nice interior here with a matte aluminum style, but of course, not real aluminum here. And then door handles open, close, X logo. This is also a beautiful detail. You also have reasonable door pockets. And then the interior of the iX3 is not too different. Here again, the blue accentuation around the logo. You can also see it here around the shifting lever. As for the seats, there are normal seats and sport seats available and standard would actually be a Sensatec animal-free cover in black or brown. It almost looks the same as it is right here also with these patches here, but this is the optional animal skin surface and the only dif difference you see there, this has like a double stitching here, which the Sensatec seat would not have, but you really have to know that to see then or feel the difference. Comfort is actually quite good. In the X3, you already have a sophisticated SUV seating position. The BMW X1, you know, is meanwhile also an SUV, not only a crossover anymore, but here the X3 def definitely gives you like this grown up SUV feeling already. So a nice and comfortable seating position. Steering wheel up and down, in and out, good smooth process. And the good thing here about the X3 is it's not as large as the X5, but already gives you a lot of comfort and a lot of space and so on. So I think it's, you know, in a lot of ways a good compromise. One meters 86 or 6 with 1 still leaves enough headroom, even if you have this optional panoramic roof right here. That's not properly powered yet, the car at the moment, but you can also open it. It has an actually quite wide opening. And here, different interior color. However, this is again the animal skin material. And there's also a seat form change possible. So this is the sport seat. We also seen it with the black seats here today. And the sensor deck I've been talking about is only available for the base comfort seat. So here the sport seat, a little bit stronger bolt string here. Sadly, these are not available with the sensor tech, so BMW here in this case did not really understand what it means to be more sustainable with the electric vehicle. So only Sensatec for the comfort base seats. They will give you a little bit more comfort. These here are a little bit sportier. Interior overview, typical X3, soft touch dashboard. Then here this infotainment screen is like this popped up, but it's very good to see. You here get standard for the iX3, the otherwise optional BMW Live Cockpit Professional, 10.25 inch on the right. 12.3 inch on the left as for the screens and OS 7 operating system 7 from the BMW features Apple CarPlay and Android Auto and both wireless now. So soon more deals to the screens. Steering wheel with a good size, right side for the volume and nice these you know, galvanized buttons and nice clicking sound feedback as well. Left side then here for controlling the cruise control also with the newest you know, assistance systems upgrade and so on. Here in the middle part, it's cool that you still have a manual volume knob, but you can also use gesture control, for example, like this. Yeah, magic. And you can also use the voice input. Hey, BMW. Where is the next charging station? Which one of the destinations shall I select? No. Oh, there's a charging station here. And also you can charge at BMW dealers. There's electric vehicle charging, charging station. Yeah, so that already works quite well, especially with GPS input and so on. Then in the lower area here, still a manual volume knob, as I said here, then also manual climate unit. This is easy to control while driving, so I really like this more old school setup here. Really also feels premium. iX3 logo in the lower part closed cover here, open it and then have inductive charging pad for your phone and adaptive cup holders. Oh, and then there's here like this optional smokers pack. I mean, when there's no smoke from the exhaust, then you need smoke inside, right? <laughs> yeah. So, and then here is interesting that you can go to a D mode or to a B mode then 
so when the car is turned on. And in B-Mode, there's then more recuperation happening. Other than that, you also have Sport, Comfort and Eco Pro Mode for the throttle input and so on. You can control the touchscreen also with this central control knob. That's possible. And then there's this armrest and it's quite well attached. And there's USB-C charging then underneath next to this cubby hole. And one more close-up here. What is my range would also be a voice command, for example, also suggesting what you can actually, you know, say to the system. Then the GPS map also shows you some charging stations and reacts quite well. So nicely done as for that. Really responsive like this. And here in these car settings, for example, you can also have the independent climate unit, for example, that always comes with electric vehicles or plan your charging and so on. Um, not sure how often this is then being used. Um, the preheating, uh, not sure what that was. Yeah, you can select the individual driver driver's profiles as well. Journey data, for example, will go more into depth when we drive the vehicle. And here the Apple CarPlay integration, like this, very well done. And we're out and also available. And the sound system here, the Optional Harman Kardon sound system. Wow, it's really cool, very rich sound. So, yeah, can just recommend that here. And then you can always go back to the BMW menu. By the way, always interesting to see, you can also switch the recuperation here inside. And adaptive recuperation would mean that the car actually realizes what's happening on the outside. So, just rolling when there's nothing in the front, but when there's a car in the, in the front or you approach a roundabout, you approach next traffic light, then there's more recuperation. So supposed to be the most efficient driving. And then you can also set the recuperation level for the D, for the drive mode, to high, medium or low. But I think it makes most sense to stick it here with the adaptive in the D mode and then switch to the B mode to the left if you want this, you know, highest recuperation. But actually, like from all the experience BMW has, the adaptive mode supposed to be the best one and when we start the vehicle here the start stop button is also in this nice blue color and here the digital instruments stand for the ix3 as i said and now when i hit the start stop button listen to the sound designed by hans zimmer so this is the new electric startup sound with it will be the same for all bmw electric vehicles and when you shut it off again it's like uh, and uh. So then tell us in the comments what you think about this Hans Zimmer sound design. And here also nice visualization also of the actual vehicle color in the inside of the instruments. And then we can see on the left side the speed and on the right side here we have the power output. And then we can also see the recuperation meter and so on and tell you more about that when we drive the vehicle. And the head-up display is a nice option, speed the current one and also loud speed and GPS error informations if you have a destination set. Ambient lighting set to blue here. That's the most fitting one, but you can also change the colors. And it's actually quite, quite nicely integrated here at the side of the dashboard and also at the inside of the doors and so on. Any compromises on the rear bench? Let's first take a look. It looks quite normal for the X3. Definitely here, middle tunnel here with two USB-C chargers. You can see it in the lower part right there. And also a rear climate unit. And let's take a seat. Soft touch, center tech also at the inside of the doors, upper part. And yeah, just totally fine. Really comfortable, enough leg room. And again, with 1 meter 86 or 6 one, also enough headroom. Would be a little more headroom if you leave out the panoramic roof, but that's totally fine. So comfortable seating here then you can control here the back part of the seats a little bit with the, this um, lever here in the in the angle you can also fold them directly from here i mean this is more for the angle and this and the upper part to fold them directly i also fix it the outside part then in the middle yeah i mean you can also reasonably sit in the middle not the most comfortable one because the bolt string is a little bit stiffer right there there is still somewhat a middle tunnel. This shows us that it's not like a primary electric vehicle platform. And they also sometimes do it then, for example, for stability reasons. But in this case, then also the X3 usually would be all-way drive. Then they also leave the middle tunnel here in this EV version. So they can, for example, use it for you know more battery storage and so on, or just for stability reasons. Then here, 
adaptive cup holders, so more cubby hole space. And you can also just fold this middle ski hatch if you like. As for the trunk, 510 up to 1560 liters means hardly any compromise as for that. If you compare it with the combustion engine version, really square dimensions, very nicely done. This cover here is also not too bad, easy. So the only thing you lose, you don't have too much space here underneath. But I think we can really live with that. Even loading sill, good quality and so on. And to fold the seats, you can also use the mechanism right here, left and right. Good solution, so a very well usable electric vehicle. Finally, something from the German premium manufacturers that is also not too big. You know, mid-size SUV or electric, this is something that the market will demand. Welcome to Thomas's Driving Lounge with the BMW iX3, all electric. Startup sound, yeah, I just want to show that to you one more time. Putting the leave it in drive mode and then we start all silent. Really cool. However, there's also an acoustic feedback when putting the, you know, pushing the throttle. I'll show that to you very soon. There we go to the sport mode. So best boost here with the rear wheel drive and we accelerate out of the corner. See how agile this car is actually. Wow, that's awesome, really cool. And you maybe also heard that sound. So when I'm in the sport mode, there's more acoustic feedback also. And this is supposed to give you a feeling of acceleration. So not only silent acceleration, but you, that you really have, you know, some kind of a, of a feeling what, of what's happening there actually. And we can also do a zero to 100 kilometers an hour or a zero to 60 miles an hour right here. And this is, again, so easy with the electric vehicles. I don't need a launch control or something. Uh, just push the throttle all the way. Let's go. Well, that's it. And really powerful. And I think the electric sound is it's actually quite nice. You know, it gives you indeed a little bit more of a feeling of what's happening. And this can actually be quite good for driver and co-driver because sometimes you know you have like a spontaneous acceleration from electric vehicles and your brain doesn't really cope with it because it's so fast and there's no sound feedback so just as a difference when I'm in the comfort mode and do an acceleration and then again when I'm in the sport mode and do acceleration you know it's a little bit louder um, you can also individualize it, either depending on the drive mode um, or you can, for example, also turn it off. So electric motor sound deactivated and then there's nothing, you know. The question is, would we be looking forward to, your, to hear your feedback on that one. Would you rather go for no feedback at all, like you know, many other electric vehicles, or would you rather have this? You know, sound feedback when accelerating. It's of course all artificial. The question is, is it a benefit for the customer or is it just annoying? We also had the discussion with the Porsche Taycan where you can also turn it off or it's also, you know, bound to a driving mode that you more have it in the sport mode and you don't have it like in normal comfort driving mode. I'm not sure about it yet. So, hmm. Usually I was more a fan of all silent, but when it's electric, then you go all silent, but it's interesting, but I think to me it reminds me more of a combustion engine. So maybe it's interesting as a transition or so. But I don't know. What do you think, Michelle? It's good or? It's okay. It's okay, I, says? Yeah. I mean, would, would, you, would you actually activate it in the electric vehicle? I guess I would. Okay, Michelle would. I probably would deactivate it, speaking you know, speaking now. So we're 50-50. So you decide then who wins, right? Acceleration to the motorway. Let's see, you get on the, in a safe spot. And so far, I mean, like the driving agility of this vehicle is superb. It feels like a sports car. That's 120. Wow really awesome it's so much fun it's definitely the like the 
most fun ride in an BMW X3 I, I ever had. I mean, not only the acceleration, just the 0 to 100 kilometer acceleration would be a little bit better in a 30i or something, but here it feels actually faster and like the, you know, like 0 to 60 kilometers. This is then, for example, faster with the all electric version, you know, like from the standstill to compare like a, you know, comparable power combustion engines. But also from the whole driving dynamics, indeed, the center of gravity is lower with this vehicle. So the steering input is really good and you feel a low center of, wow, it's really amazing. I can just stress that due to the low center of gravity, the car feels so sporty. It, like from the sporty characteristics, it does not feel like a grown-up SUV anymore. It really rather feels like a like a sporty 3 series sedan or so. That's really amazing. So the, you know, enormous additional weight due to this battery pack is not playing, you know, playing bad with the car or something. It really affects the car in a very very positive way and I mean, I, I even would have fun like to, to drive it on a racetrack now. This is yeah, I'm totally, um, totally flabbergasted what, what they've done here with the, with the X3. So definitely, I can already tell you right now, if you have the charging infrastructure and if the price is somewhat okay, BMW wants to lower the prices also for the iX3 in comparison to the combustion engine models. Um, like, not cheaper than the combustion engine, but wants to, you know, um, you know even out this, you know, this price difference a little bit. So if you can do that, just driving wise for the customer experience from the driving this electric version here beats all other combustion engines it's so much fun to drive it's really amazing it's amazing <laughs> so and then let's drive a little bit faster on the motorway we can also do that here right now at the moment unlimited speed oh, come on let's go to the sports one once more and even here in the high speed areas you can still accelerate very well 160 kilometers an hour Wow, and how silent and stable the car is remaining. Adaptive suspension is standard for this vehicle here in the sports mode. It's set a little bit stiffer, but great balance between comfort and sportiness, even here with the 20-inch wheels. So 19-inch would be a little bit more comfortable, but 20-inch still work. Here at 170 kilometers an hour, we start to pick up a little bit of wind noise, but still, I mean, we're driving the SUV. It's an upright car, and it's super silent also here high speed on the motorway. Wow, so awesome, so flawless here in the driving. I'm really, really impressed. Good overview also to the rear, to the sides, upright building style. This is like a very, very good mid-size SUV. And I mean, just from the, again, from the customer experience, from driving and what it delivers, probably now one of the best mid-size SUV overall. Um, yeah, I can, I can just stress it again. If you then go for the Sensatec seats with the base comfort seats, even better, they deliver you a little bit more comfort and also, you know, follow more this sustainability approach of the whole electric vehicle, then it's really all fine and doing so well here on the motorway, definitely. I mean, this was here now quite heavy in the, um, you know, acceleration and so on. So when I go to the journey data here now, then it tells us like a very high uh, electric consumption figure so yeah more than 25 kilowatt hours on one kilometers that's of course when we really like floor it all out what we really want to find out is the range realistic according to the energy consumption and so I'll reset it here now and then start the driving part you know with more like with about efficiency and so on and so on so we reset individual also set the cruise control here. There's the assistant driving function or, the, or just the distance control. So both is actually available. And with the assisted driving, the car is also keeping me in the lane, like this. Active lane keeping assist and quite good center, not too intrusive. There's also blind spot monitor. We can see it right here. And when I put the turning indicators, then also starts to flash as an additional warning. So assist systems wise, here also keeping the distance to the car in front of us. And this we're also really playing together with the electric drive of the vehicle. So what's happening? I'm at the moment in normal driving mode and it's about the adaptive recuperation that is standard for the vehicle. So 
when I'm just rolling, the car is not recuperating at all using rolling energy, which is more efficient if you want to cover more distance. Then, if you want to decelerate anyway, recuperation makes sense, of course, instead of using the normal brakes. And that's happening when you use the normal brakes, that's happening when you are in this B mode for stronger recuperation, but also then here in the adaptive recuperation mode. So when the car is in front of us here now and they are decelerating, also the adaptive recuperation does that. So I'm gaining back the energy. Or when like there's a next intersection on the, or when there's a next traffic light, for example, then this adaptive recuperation is active and thus BMW claims is the most efficient driving mode. The B mode would be the mode you go in for when you want the one pedal feeling. However, the thing is, when this adaptive recuperation is really so intelligent, probably you won't need it. And then it's actually good when you have situations. I cancel the cruise control now. Let's just test it. So I'm running towards this truck. And indeed, strong recuperation without setting cruise control or something. So it works without GPS data, without cruise control and so on. No problem. And here now, again, in front of the truck, strong recuperation. So that works very well. Now the truck is gone beside. I, I was using the force, you know, just to like, yeah, that's, okay, yeah. <laughs> so now here, uh, there's a free road in front of us. Then I leave the throttle, no recuperation, we're rolling. Not sure if you can see that here, also in the instruments. It's just like, you know, this arrow is on the base zero line. So once again, leaving the throttle, no recuperation. Here, truck, automatic recuperation. That's, that's very well done. What a cool system. So this really um, gives you more efficiency because again, when you want to cover more distance, rolling is more efficient, of course, than you know, getting on the throttle and re recuperate again. So rolling overall makes more sense, unless then again, if you want to reduce the speed anyway. And in this case, I think, most of the time I really like to have strong recuperation modes with the electric vehicles or plug-in hybrids. But when you have a mechanism like this, I think you can easily leave it in this automatic mode, leave it in this adaptive recuperation mode, and you're probably even happier because the car really adapts it to the according situation. And I think that's really, really well done. What would be the difference? Here the B mode. So when I get off the throttle, strong recuperation and it's really notable deceleration. But that's always happening then. It also has like a sing singling arrow then in this digital instrument for that. So always then when I get off the throttle, it's like this. Maybe you say, I, I'm, you know, I want to drive an electric vehicle like this. Then you, can <clears throat> then you can still do it. It's not the standard mode when you put in the D mode, but at least you still have the choice to do so. But I found this approach here with the adaptive recuperation really really interesting so you know more and more things we learn about this you know these electric vehicles so now when we take a look we have had more like constant speed now you know and this about the yeah 16 kilowatt hours on 100 kilometers fuel economy or well, energy economy if we have to say it now so used to these vocabularies and 16 kilowatt hours on 100 kilometers would actually exactly hit the projected official range figure of 460 kilometers or 285 miles. So this is also quite impressive. For a mid-size SUV, this is indeed quite efficient. We can even bring it a little bit down. I mean, like one or 20 kilometers an hour is not like the ideal best fuel economy test for an electric vehicle. Like something between, like, you know, 80, 90, 100 would be the best for a con um, combustion engine. And also here, you know, when you put it like 80 kilometers an hour cruise control, because it would, you know, be even better here for that. Um, because the thing is, <clears throat> we get out the motorway very soon now. The thing is with the um, combustion engines, they have a sweet spot as for the, you know, efficient consumption. So when you say like cruise control, 100 kilometers an hour or something, that will be kind of most efficient. But with electric vehicles is, the faster you go, the higher consumption is, period. So it will be lower with lower speeds. You know, there's no like a sweet spot of, of best consumption. It's just lower or higher. Uh, and that's why we can also score a better fuel economy than if we just drive 
to know up with this vehicle, but um, <clears throat> this is also a realistic everyday driving figure, you know, when we're on the motorway and, you know, maybe commuting to work with 100, 120 kilometers an hour, like, you know, 60 to 70 miles an hour or something. So this is really, really realistic. And we now see that when we recuperate a little bit more, then the consumption even goes down a little bit more. And we also have now some like countryside driving and see how that, you know, evolves. But so far, the impression is really, that's also what, what BMW claimed, and I was, you know, skeptical about that at first. So they said that they didn't put the battery bigger. They wanted to cover more range with being more efficient. Also, for example, like in the front, these air channels or air curtains that go from the front to the wheel arches, we know it from combustion engine models, that would um, increase efficiency than the aero wheels, you know, that also optimize the wind flow in the wheel arches. Um, and the, the heat pump, especially when it's cold. Yeah, the other day, I mean, yeah, 7.5 degrees Celsius is not actually, it's not too warm, actually. Um, so the heat pump also plays a role for that, definitely. And also this new motor design they have, which is more efficient if they also compare it to like the BMW i3, which was the like initial all electric project now. Um, so this has been made definitely more efficient here also with a synchronous motor. So, so far, you know, really good in performance. The driving, the handling is superb. And now also the efficiency uh, figure is actually quite good. It's even getting better. So now we have some more regenerative braking moments. We're about 13 kilometer hours, more kilometers. This would even exceed the official range figures. So, yeah, I think, I mean, I'm, I'm really, really impressed. So once again, to me, the problem with electric mobility is rather the infrastructure. Sometimes prices are, of course, still higher. Then you have sometimes like governmental you know, benefits or something that even that out. The driving experience is meanwhile, if you don't miss like a V8 sound or something, driving experience is probably the best with electric vehicles, just from a customer perspective. Um, range is getting better and better with you know with the batteries or also with more efficiency and you know when you're driving like 20,000 miles 40,000 kilometers a year then maybe combustion engine is still better for you but for most shorter ways and everyday commuting electric vehicles are more suitable actually to me it's really about do you have a proper charging infrastructure which relieves stress for fueling up the, the vehicle instead of, you know, annoying you. That's to me, I think, like the, the crucial thing. When you have a bad infrastructure, then the electric vehicles won't be fun. When you have a good charging infrastructure, when you can just plug it in at home, then you have a lot of fun. Now some countryside driving. So this will be like, some, like not too slow speed, but also not really super high speeds. And we can really have also a joy ride with this vehicle. When it would be nicer weather, we could also open the, the roof. Um, and here at the moment we just leave a lot of light in and the car really feels so well balanced and indeed the experience we have had now for quite some time that the electric vehicles are really more fun to drive and the added weight is something which is rather an S to the vehicle gives more stability on the road um, actually puts the you know center of gravity lower told that told you about that initially and makes the car even more agile in the corners here again direct you know response from the steering and so on yeah and once again the adaptive recuperation is working very well and by the way when you go on the brakes you can, you can accelerate here wow spontaneous accelerate awesome just awesome really like it is like this is a sports car this is an suv this is an efficient vehicle it's a comfortable one. Um, I'm, I'm really absolutely blown away. And um, I mean, I've driven like like 2,000 cars now in my life, and that, that doesn't happen that often, you know, that I'm really like so satisfied with almost everything in detail besides the <laughs> seating service setup here. Um, yeah, so that really speaks for itself. And I know the BMW X3 for, you know, the previous generation, this generation, We've been driving it in so many different engine versions, also in the M version and so on. 
and this is by so far the best and most striking version they've done. Yeah, this is um, in driving, in all aspects, top notch. And now to our conclusion, which one is the best in which aspects, which one should you buy and which one is the best overall and what would I pick? The Tesla Model Y leads in efficiency and range and in the infotainment system. It also offers a lot of space and it is always completely animal free. However, it lacks instruments or head-up display, the seats are not the best from the comfort and it has the worst suspension in the test. However, together with the Tesla superchargers, it is without doubt one of the best picks. If driving agility is more important to you, and if you are keen on a true SUV feeling, the BMW iX3 is way to go. However, it is the most expensive one in the test, and if you want a head-up display or the premium sound system, you automatically have to get the animal skin seats. Why? That's disappointing. However, it shows the most classic or conservative user interface, what we consider in this case at the good thing, because a lot of the new user interfaces are kinda bollocks. The Hyundai Ioniq 5 charges quite fast, if you have speeded it in the Autobahn first and the battery is warm, has the coolest retro design and a fresh interior approach, but a bad infotainment system and also some problems in the user interface. Still, it is a very good pick. In the US, the slick surface seats are from Sustainable the Red, in Europe they use animal skin. Hmm. The Ford Mustang Mach E also has a coolness factor, always an animal free interior and is fun to drive. It also offers a fast infotainment system. Recently there were some rumors about overheating issues when you were driving it in a performance way. They want to fix that by software updates and it also accounts for if you would use it on the racetrack or really in a rather extreme way. The VW Group Brothers of VW ID4, Škoda Enyaq and Audi Q4 e-tron all come close, whereas the Audi has the best user interface and the Škoda Enyaq the most space on the interior. Overall, all EV SUVs or crossovers in this test show very good individual skills. Range speaks for the Tesla Model Y, driving fun and classic layout for the BMW iX3. The Hyundai Ioniq 5, by the way, also comes close to its Kia EV6 sibling because they share the same technology. The Ford Mustang Mach-E seems to be a very good all-rounder. Škoda Enyaq and VW ID4 do not have suitable infotainment systems or user interfaces. The Audi Q4 is better in that respect. Me personally, I appreciate the great mix of the Ford Mustang Mach-E. Sustainable vegan interior, cool looks, good efficiency, driving fun and comfort as well as a modern infotainment system. The BMW iX3 is also great if money doesn't play a role, it's the most expensive one in the test. However, I would try to push BMW to give me the center tech seats, but with the Harman Kardon sound system, still, the steam wheel would come with animal skin. A little disappointing. The Tesla Model Y is great and a lot speaks for it, but I, me personally, I don't want to drive without instruments, especially at night. The Hyundai Ioniq 5 has some user interface disadvantages in everyday driving life. It is still very good, but I appreciate more of an SUV than a crossover driving position. The three VW Group products just cannot convince entirely if you compare the competitors, but overall still show very good features. So all cars we presented to you today are really good ones. In this case here, the Ford Mustang Mach-E, that's the one then in this case for me. But what's your pick after seeing our comparison? Tell me in the comments.